On the fourth day, when Ramon came to her room in the clinic, he was accompanied by three sober gentlemen in dark suits, all of them bearing important-looking briefcases. One was an attorney, another was an official from the state registrar's office, and the third was the local magistrate. The magistrate bore witness as Isabella signed the order of adoption, relinquishing her guardianship of Nicholas to the Marquez de Santiago y Machado, and he placed his official seal on the document. The birth certificate provided by the registrar showed Ramon as the father. After the officials had toasted the mother and child with a large glass of sherry and left, Ramon took Isabella tenderly in his arms. Your son's claim to the title is secure, he whispered. Our son, she whispered in reply, and kissed him. My men, Nicky and Ramon. When Ramon fetched them from the clinic and brought them back to the flat, Isabella insisted on carrying Nicky up the stairs herself. Adra had filled bowls of flowers to welcome them. She took the child out of Isabella's arms. He is wet. I will change him. And Isabella felt like a lioness deprived of her cub. Over the days that followed, an unspoken but nevertheless intense competition developed between the two women. Although Isabella acknowledged Adra's obvious expertise in dealing with the infant, she found herself resenting the intrusion. She wanted Nicky all to herself, and she tried to anticipate his needs and to get to him ahead of Adra. The florid birth tones of Nicky's face soon faded into a peachy perfection, and his thick dark hair curled. When he opened his eyes for the first time, they were that exact same shade of pale green as Ramon's. Isabella considered this one of the great miracles of the universe. You are as beautiful as your father, she told him, as she suckled him. At least that was one service that Adra could not render him. In the months that they had lived in the village, Isabella had become a local favourite. Her loveliness and her easy, engaging manner, her pregnancy and her sincere efforts to master the language had delighted the tradespeople and the stallholders in the marketplace. In response to their entreaties, when Nicky was barely ten days old, she laid him in the pram and paraded him through the village. It was a triumphant progress, and they returned to the flat, laden with small gifts and with their ears ringing with praises. When she phoned home on Easter Day, her grandmother asked severely, What is so important in Spain that you cannot come home to Weltfrieden? Oh, Nana, I love you all, but it's just impossible. Please forgive me. If I know you, young lady, which I do, you are up to no good, and it wears trousers. Nana, you're an absolute shocker. How can you believe that of me? Twenty years of experience, Santon Courtney Malcolm S. told her dryly. Just don't get into any more trouble, child. I won't, I promise, Isabella told her sweetly, and hugged the infant to her bosom. Oh, if only you knew, she thought. He doesn't wear trousers. Well, not yet, anyway. Uh, how's the thesis going? her father asked when he came on the line. She could not tell him that she had already submitted it, for that was her excuse for remaining in Spain. Almost done, she compromised. She hadn't thought about it since Nicky had come along. Good luck with it. And then Shaza was silent for a moment. Do you remember our talk? The promise you gave me? Uh, which one? she procrastinated guiltily. She knew very well what he was referring to. You promised that if you were ever in trouble, any trouble at all, you wouldn't try to go it alone. You would come to me. Yes, I remember. Are you all right, Bella baby? I'm fine. Wonderful, just marvellous, Daddy. He heard the ring of it in her voice and sighed with relief. Happy Easter, my bright and beautiful daughter. With Michael, it was a relief to let it all out of her. They were on the telephone for 45 minutes, Mulliga to Johannesburg, and she tickled Nicky to make him gurgle for his distant uncle. When are you coming home, Bella? Michael asked at last. Ramon's divorce will be through by June, that's definite. We will have a civil marriage here in Spain and the church wedding at Veltefrieden. I expect you to be at both functions. Try to stop me, he challenged her. They celebrated Easter dinner at their favourite seaside restaurant, with Nicky's pram parked at the table. The patron's wife had knitted a jacket for the baby. Adra was with them. 
She was part of their small family by now, and she wheeled the pram when they walked home to the flat. Isabella clung to Ramon's arm. She felt very married and maternal, and as happy as she had ever been in her entire life. When they arrived at the flat, Adra took Nicky away to change him. For once, Isabella did not resent it. In the front bedroom, she lowered the shutters and then came to Ramon. It's three weeks since Nicky was born. I'm not made of glass, you know. I won't break. He was too gentle, too considerate for her mood. She had been without him for too long. I think you've forgotten how to do this, she said, and pushed him over on his back. Let me refresh your memory, sir. Oh, don't hurt yourself, he cautioned anxiously. If anybody gets hurt around here, it's more likely to be you, my friend. Now fasten your seatbelt. We're ready for takeoff. Afterwards, in the shuttered room, she lay against him in languorous exhaustion, their bodies sticking lightly together with the sweat of their loving, and he said, I have to go away for four days next week. She sat up quickly. Oh, Ramon, so soon, she protested, and then realised that she was being possessive and unreasonable. You'll phone me every day, won't you? she demanded. I'll do better than that. I'll be in Paris, and I'll try to arrange for you to join me there. We will have dinner at La Serre. Oh, that would be lovely, but what about Nicky? Oh, Nicky's got Adra to look after him, Ramon chuckled. <laughs> Nicky will be all right, and Adra will love the opportunity to have him all to herself. Oh, I don't know, she said dubiously. The thought of being parted from her wondrous achievement for even an hour appalled her. It'll be for only one night, and you have really earned a little reward. Come on. Besides, I need you too, you know. Oh, my darling. His appeal touched her. Her flow of milk was copious. She could express enough to cover the feeds that Nicky would need during such a short absence. Of course, I'd love to be with you. You're right. Nicky and Adra will survive a night without me. I'll come as soon as you call me. The woman gave birth to her brat almost a month ago, General Joseph Cicero whispered hoarsely. What has been the delay? You should have terminated the operation immediately. The cost has been out of all proportion. The General will recall that I am meeting the cost out of funds that I have provided, not out of the departmental budget, Ramon reminded him quietly. Cicero coughed and rustled the copy of Francois, which he held before his face. They sat side by side in a second-class coach of the Paris Metro. Cicero had entered the coach at the Concord station and taken the seat beside Ramon. Neither of them had shown any sign of recognition. The rush of the train through the underground tunnel would foil any eavesdropper. Both of them used open newspapers to cover their faces, their talk. This was one of their regular procedures for short meetings. I was not referring only to the cost in rubles, Cicero wheezed. You have spent nearly a year on this project, an incalculable cost to the other work of the department. Ramon was fascinated by the rapid course of the disease that was destroying his superior. It seemed that at every meeting, Joseph Cicero had deteriorated visibly. It would not be much longer, months rather than years. These few months of work will pay us back enormous dividends over the years, and, yes, over the decades ahead, Work, snorted Cicero, stirring the honeypot with your spoon. If that is work, how do you define pleasure, Marquez? And why are you prolonging termination month after month? If the woman is to be the utmost value to us, then it is absolutely necessary that she bond to the child before we proceed to the next step in the operation. And when will that be? Cicero demanded. It has happened already. The fruit is ripe for picking. Everything is in place. I need your cooperation in the final resolution. And that is why I chose Paris for this meeting. Cicero nodded. Well, go on, he invited. And Ramon spoke quietly for another five minutes. Cicero listened without comment, but grudgingly he admitted to himself that the plan was airtight. Once again he acceded privately that his successor seemed to have been well chosen, despite the original prejudice he had fostered towards him. Oh, very well, he whispered at last. You have approval to proceed, and as you request, I will monitor proceedings at this end. Cicero folded his newspaper and stood up as the coach slid into the metro station at Bastille on its silent rubber wheels.
As the doors opened, he stepped down onto the platform and walked away without looking back. The notification from London University arrived the afternoon that Ramon left. It took the form of an express letter with the university's coat of arms embossed on the flap of the envelope. The Chancellor and the faculty members of the University of London take pleasure in informing Isabella Courtney that she has been awarded the degree of Doctor of Philosophy of the University. Isabella telephoned Felter Frieden immediately. There was little time difference between Malaga and Cape Town, and Shaza had just returned from the polo field. He was still in boots and breeches, and he took the call in the downstairs study, whose French windows overlooked the field. Son of a gun, he let out a whoop when she told him. Such an uncharacteristic display was proof to her of her father's deep delight. When will they cap you, darling? Oh, uh, not until June or July. I'll have to stay until then. It was the excuse she had been looking for. Of course, Shaza agreed immediately. I'll come over. Oh, Daddy, it's such a long way. Nonsense, Dr. Courtney. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Your grandmother will probably want to come with me. Strangely, the prospect did not alarm her, as it might have. She realised that it was probably the ideal occasion for both her father and Nana to meet Ramon and Nicky. Santan Courtney Malcolm S., of her home ground, was not such a daunting prospect as she was when installed in all the splendour and tradition of Filter Frieden. More than anything at that moment, Isabella wanted to share her joy in her achievement with Ramon, but he did not telephone that night nor even the following day. By Thursday morning, she was almost frantic with worry. It was so unlike Ramon. Usually he telephoned every day that they were apart. When finally the telephone rang, she was in the tiny kitchen, in a heated argument with Adra as to how many cloves of garlic should go into the paella. You would inject the stuff into your veins if you were given the chance, she accused in her now fluent Spanish. We are making paella, not Irish stew. Adra held her ground, and then the telephone rang, and Isabella dropped the spoon with a clatter and knocked over the chair in the hall in her haste to reach it. Ramon, darling, I was so worried. I missed your call. I'm sorry, Bella. The rich, dark tones of his voice soothed her, so her own voice became a purr. Do you still love me? Come to Paris, and I will prove it to you. When? Now. I have made a reservation for you on the Air France flight at eleven o'clock. They are holding your ticket at the airport. You will be here by two o'clock. Where will I meet you? At the Plaza Athene. We have a suite. You spoil me, Ramon, darling. No less than you deserve. She left the flat immediately. However, the Air France takeoff was delayed by forty minutes. In Paris, the baggage handlers were working to rule so she stood fuming and fretting at the baggage carousel for almost an hour before her overnight case made its leisurely appearance. It was after five o'clock in the evening before her taxi pulled up in the Avenue Montaigne, before the elegant façade of the Plaza Athene, with its scarlet awnings. She half expected Ramon to be waiting for her in the marbled and mirrored foyer, and looked about eagerly as she came in through the revolving glass doors. He was not there. She paid no heed to the gaunt figure who sat in one of the gilt and brocade armchairs opposite the reception desk. The man lifted his head of lank white hair and for a moment regarded her with strangely lifeless tar-black eyes. Then he coughed harshly and returned his attention to the newspaper he was reading. Isabella crossed quickly and expectantly to the concierge's counter. "'You have a guest?' The Marquise de Santiago de Machado. I am his wife. A moment, madame. The uniform concierge consulted the guest list, and then shook his head and frowned as he started again at the head of the list. I am sorry, Marquesa. The Marquise is not staying with us at the moment. Oh, well, perhaps he was registered as Monsieur Machado. <laughs> I am afraid not. We have nobody of that name. Isabella looked confused. Uh, I, I, I don't understand. I spoke to him this morning. I will make a further inquiry. The concierge left her for a moment to consult the booking clerk and returned almost immediately. Your husband is not with us. There is no reservation for him. Oh, well, he, uh, he must have been delayed, 
Isabella tried to look unconcerned. Uh, do you have a room for me? Uh, the hotel is uh, fully booked. The concierge spread his hands apologetically. <laughs> it is spring, you understand. I, uh, I am desolated, Marquesa. Uh, Paris is, is, is overflowing. He must be coming, Isabella insisted brightly. Do you mind if I, I wait for my husband in the gallery? Uh, of course not, Marquesa. The waiter will bring you coffee and whatever refreshment you wish. The porter will guard your baggage in his store. As she moved towards the long gallery, which at the cocktail hour was the fashionable meeting place for Le Tout Paris, the white-haired gentleman rose from his armchair. He moved stiffly, with the gait of a frail and sick old man. But Isabella, in her consternation, did not even glance in his direction. Cicero went out into the street, and the doorman hailed a taxi for him, and it dropped him in Rue Grenelle. He walked the last block to the Soviet embassy, and the guard at the night desk recognised him as he approached. From the office of the military attaché on the second floor, Joe Cicero phoned a number in Malaga. The woman is waiting at the hotel, he whispered huskily. She cannot return before noon tomorrow. You may proceed as planned. A little before seven o'clock, the concierge came and found Isabella in the gallery. There has been a, a cancellation, Marquesa. We have a room for you now. I have already sent your baggage up. She could have kissed him, but instead tipped him a hundred francs. From the room she rang the flat in Malaga. She hoped that Ramon might have left a message with Adra, now that the arrangements had so obviously gone awry. Although she let the telephone ring for a count of one hundred peals, there was no reply. That truly alarmed her. Adra should have been there. The telephone was in the hallway just outside her bedroom door. Isabella telephoned again twice more during the night, each time without success. The telephone's out of order, she told herself with conviction, but she hardly slept at all. As soon as the airline reservations office opened, she booked a flight back to Malaga, and despite her distress she managed to sleep for an hour during the journey. It was after midday when they landed at Malaga airport. The taxi dropped her at the front door of the apartment block, and she dragged her bag to their front door. With fingers that shook with fatigue and agitation, she finally got the key into the lock. The apartment was strangely silent, and her voice rang through the open doorway. Adra, I'm back. Where are you? She glanced into the kitchen as she hurried to Adra's room. The room was empty, and she started up the stairs at a run and then stopped abruptly at the door to her bedroom. It was wide open. Nicky's cot still stood in the alcove opposite the window. It was stripped of sheets and pillows and blankets, that exquisite layette that Michael had sent from home. The table beside the cot, on which had stood Nicky's platoon of soft toys, the teddies and bunnies and Disney creatures, which she had showered on him, was bare. She stepped to the terrace door and glanced out. His pram was gone. Adra, she cried, and heard the high, thin tone of panic in her own voice. Where are you? She raced through the other rooms. Nicky, my baby, oh God, please, where have you taken Nicky? She found herself back in the main bedroom beside his empty cot. I don't understand, she whispered. What's happened? On a sudden impulse, she whirled and jerked open the drawers of Nicky's bureau. They were all empty. The nappies and vests and jackets were all of them gone. The hospital, her voice was a sob. Something's happened to my baby. She rushed down the stairs and seized the telephone, and then froze as she saw the envelope taped to the cradle of the instrument. She dropped the telephone receiver and ripped open the envelope. Her hands shook so that she could barely read the words on the single sheet of notepaper. However, she recognised Ramon's handwriting instantly and felt a treacherous rush of relief, which evaporated swiftly as she read the words. Nicholas is with me. He is safe for the time being. If you wish to see him again, you must follow these instructions exactly. Do not speak to anybody in Malaga. I repeat, do not speak to anybody. Leave the flat immediately and return to London. You will be contacted at Cadogan Square. 
Tell nobody what has happened, not even your brother Michael. Follow these instructions implicitly. Your disobedience will have dire consequences for Nicky. You may never see him again. Destroy this note. R. Her legs went soft and boneless under her, and she sank down against the wall and sat on the tiled floor with them sprawled out loosely in front of her, as though they were disjointed at the hips. She read the note again, and then again, but it didn't make sense. My baby, she whispered. My little Nicky. And then she read the terrible words aloud. Your disobedience will have dire consequences for Nicky. You may never see him again. She let the hand holding the note drop into her lap, and she stared at the wall opposite. She felt as though the world and her entire existence had been swept away. It left her as blank and meaningless as that empty expanse of brickwork in front of her. She did not know how long she sat there, but at last, with a supreme effort, she roused herself. Using the wall as a support, she regained her feet. Once more she climbed the stairs to their bedroom and went directly to Ramon's cupboard. She threw the doors open and found that it also was empty. Even the coat hangers were gone. She moved listlessly to the chest of drawers and opened each empty drawer. Ramon had left nothing. She wandered back to Nicky's alcove, moving like the survivor of a bomb blast, dazed and uncoordinated, and knelt beside the empty cot. My baby, she whispered, what have they done with you? Then she saw that something had slipped down between the baby mattress and the wooden bars of the cot. She eased it free and held it in both hands. Kneeling at the cot as though it were the high altar, she held the sacrament in her hands. It was one of Nicky's booties a scrap of soft knitted wool with a blue satin ribbon as the drawstring for his chubby pink ankle. She lifted it to her face and inhaled the perfumed baby smell of her son. Only then she began to weep. She wept with a bitter ferocity that drained her strength and left her exhausted. By that time the terrace and the bedroom were filled with the shades of evening and she had only the strength left to crawl to the double bed and curl up on it. As she fell asleep, she held the woolen booty pressed to her cheek. It was still dark when she awoke. She lay for long seconds with the dark sense of doom overpowering her, uncertain of its origin or cause. Then suddenly it all came back to her, and she struggled upright and looked about her with horror. Ramon's note lay on the table beside the bed. She took it up and reread it, still trying to make sense of it. Ramon, my darling, why are you doing this to us? she whispered. Then, obedient to his instructions, she carried the note to the bathroom and, standing over the toilet bowl, tore it into tiny scraps. She dropped these into the bowl and flushed them away. She knew that every word would be graven on her mind forever. She had no need nor wish to conserve that dreadful sheet of paper. She showered and dressed and made herself a slice of toast and a pot of coffee. They were without taste. Her mouth felt numb, as though it had been scalded with boiling water. Then she set herself to search the apartment thoroughly. She began in Adra's room. There was no trace left of Adra Olivares. Not a shred of clothing, not a pot or a tube of ointment or cosmetics in her bathroom, not even a single hair from her head on the pillow of her bed. Then she went over the living room and kitchen. Again there was nothing except the hired furniture and crockery, and the remains of food in the refrigerator. She went up to the bedroom. There was a small wall safe in the back of Ramon's cupboard, but the steel door was ajar, and all the documents were missing. Nicky's birth certificate and adoption papers were gone with them. She sat down on the bed and tried to think clearly, attempting desperately to find a reason for this madness. She went round and round, trying to examine it from every possible angle. She was driven remorselessly to a single conclusion. Ramon was in deep trouble. It was some horror from his clandestine life which had overtaken him. She knew that under extreme duress he had been forced to leave with Nicky. She understood that she must do everything in her power to help them, Ramon and Nicky, the two most important elements in her life. She knew that she must do as he ordered her. Their safety and possibly their lives depended upon it. 
yet she could not leave it like that. She had to learn more. Any morsel of knowledge might be of value. She left the apartment and went downstairs. There was a small bakery shop across the street, and over the months Isabella had become friendly with the baker's wife. The woman was opening the shutters over the shop window as Isabella hurried across the road. Yes, the baker's wife told her. After you left on Thursday, Adra went out with Nicholas in the pram. They went down towards the beach and returned just before I closed the shop. I saw them go up to your apartment, but I didn't see them again. Not after that. Isabella went up the street, stopping to question all the tradespeople whose business were within sight of the apartment block. Some of them had seen Adra and Nicky return on Thursday evening, but not one of them had seen them again since then. Her last resort was the shoeshine urchin on the corner of the park. Ramon always allowed the lad to polish his shoes and over-tipped him exorbitantly. He was one of Isabella's favourites on the street. Eh, si, signora, he grinned at Isabella as he squatted over his box. On Thursday night I work late because of the cinema and the arcade. At ten o'clock I see the Marquez. He came in a big black car with two men. They park in the street and go upstairs. But what did the other men look like, Chica? Do you know them? Had you ever seen them before? Never. They are two very tough hombre. Policemen, I think. Much trouble. I don't like the police. They all go upstairs. They soon they come down again. They all carry the suitcases. Big suitcases. Adra come with them. She carry the baby Nico. They get into the car, all of them, and they drive away. And that is all. I don't see them again. The two tough hombres confirmed what Isabella had suspected, that Ramon was acting under coercion. She realized that the only source of action open to her was to follow the instruction that Ramon had given her in the note. She went back to the apartment and began to pack up. Her redundant maternity clothes she left lying on the bedroom floor, and her good clothes filled only two cases. When she came to the drawer that contained her cosmetics, she found that the fat album of snapshots that she had accumulated since Nicky's birth was missing, together with the envelopes of negatives. It came as a shock to realise that she had no record of her baby, no photograph or souvenir apart from the single woollen booty that she had retrieved from his cot. She lugged her bulging cases downstairs and packed them into the back of the mini. Then she crossed the street and spoke to the baker's wife. If my husband comes back and asks for me, tell him I have gone back to London. But what about Nico? Are you all right, signora? The woman was sympathetic, and Isabella smiled brightly. And Nico is with my husband. I'll meet them in London soon. Muchas gracias por su ado, signora. Adios. The drive northward seemed endless. Each episode of the last few days since last she had seen her son played over and over in her mind until she felt that she was slowly going mad. On the cross-channel ferry, she forsook the loud bonhomie of the crowded saloon and went up onto the boat deck. It was a cold, grey day, with the north wind kicking the tops off the swells in dashing white spurts of spray. The wind and her despair chilled her through until she was shivering uncontrollably, even in her padded anorak. However, in the end, it was the ache in her swollen breasts that drove her below. In the women's toilet, she used the express pump to draw off the flow that should have been for her son. Oh, Nicky, Nicky, she cried silently as she discharged the rich, creamy liquid into the toilet bowl. And she imagined once again his hot little mouth on her nipples and the smell and the feel of him against her breast. She found herself weeping and with a huge effort controlled herself. You're losing your grip on reality, she warned herself. You've got to be strong now. You can't let go. For Nicky's sake, you must be strong. No more crying and moping. No more. It was raining when she drove into Cadogan Square, and the flat seemed chilly and uninviting. While she unpacked, she thought about the promise that she had made her father. Suddenly she threw down the dress that she held and ran through to the drawing room. International, I want to place a call to Cape Town, South Africa. At this time of night, the delay was less than ten minutes, and she heard the peals of the telephone at the other end. One of the servants answered it. 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 And as she opened her mouth to ask for her father, Ramon's strict injunction came back to her with all its force and threat. 
Your disobedience will have dire consequences for Nicky. She replaced the receiver on its cradle without speaking and resigned herself to wait for the promised contact. Nothing happened for six days. She never left the flat, not daring to put herself beyond the reach of the telephone. She rang nobody, spoke to nobody except the housekeeper, and tried to keep herself occupied by reading and watching television. The uncertainty aggravated her despair, and she found that although she stared at the pages of her book or at the small flickering screen of the television set, the printed words and the images were meaningless. Only her agony was real. Only her loss had poignant meaning. Only her pain abided. She could barely bring herself to eat, and within three days her milk flow had dried up. She lost weight dramatically. Her hair, which was one of the high points of her beauty, turned dull and dry. Her face in the mirror was gaunt. Her eyes sank into bruised-looking cavities, and her golden amber Mediterranean tan became sallow and yellow like the skin of a malaria sufferer. She waited, and the waiting was torture. Each hour was an insupportable eternity. Then, on the sixth day, the telephone rang. She snatched it up with desperate haste before the second peal. I have a message from Ramon. It was a woman's voice with an elusive accent, uh, probably mid-European. Leave now immediately. Take a taxi to the junction of Royal Hospital Road and the embankment. Walk down the embankment towards Westminster. Somebody will greet you with the name Red Rose. Follow their orders, said the caller. Repeat these instructions, please. Breathlessly, Isabella obeyed. Good, said the woman, and broke the connection. Isabella had not walked further than a hundred yards along the embankment above the Thames, when a small, unmarked van passed her, travelling slowly in the same direction. It pulled into the curb ahead of her, and as she drew level with it, the rear door opened to reveal a middle-aged woman in grey overalls sitting on the side bench of the body of the van. Red Rose, she said, and Isabella recognised her voice from their telephone conversation. Get in. Quickly, Isabella slipped into the van and sat on the bench opposite the woman. She slammed the door, and immediately the van pulled away. The body of the van was without windows or any opening except for the ventilator in the roof above Isabella's head. She could not see out, and though she tried to track their course by the turns and stops, she was soon totally confused and abandoned the attempt. Where are you taking me? she asked the woman opposite her. Silence, please. And Isabella resigned herself. She pulled her collar up around her ears and thrust her hands deep into the pockets of her anorak. They drove for twenty-three minutes by her wristwatch, and then the van stopped again and the rear door was opened from outside. They were in a parking garage. She judged from the unpainted concrete pillars that supported the low roof and from the steep access ramp at the far end of the long, narrow chamber that it was an underground parking facility. The woman in the grey overalls took her arm and helped her down from the van. The touch of her hand made Isabella aware of just how powerful she was. The hand felt like the paw of a gorilla. And she towered above Isabella with wide, meaty shoulders under the grey cloth. This way, she ordered. Still holding her arm, she led Isabella to the lift doors opposite the van. Despite the painful grip, Isabella glanced around her quickly. There were a dozen or so other vehicles parked in the bays alongside the van. At least two of them had diplomatic number plates. The doors of the lift opened, and the woman pushed Isabella into it. A glance at the control panel showed Isabella that her assumption had been correct. The lighted stage indicator showed that they were at basement level two. The woman pushed the button for the third floor, and they rode up in silence, until the lift stopped with the stage indicator at level three and her escort urged her out into a bare corridor with cork flooring. They walked down it side by side, and still in silence. The corridor was empty, and the doors on each side closed. As they approached the end of the corridor, the facing door slid open. Another large female, with flat Slavic features, dressed also in grey overalls, ushered them into what appeared to be a small lecture room or an intimate movie theatre. A double row of easy chairs faced the raised dais and the screen that covered the far wall. Isabella's escort led her to the chair in the front row centre. Sit down, she said, 
and Isabella sank down on the smooth, cold plastic padding. The two women moved around and took up their position, standing behind Isabella. For several minutes there was silence. Then the small door to the right of the dais opened, and a man came through. He moved slowly, stiffly, like a frail and sick old man. His hair was dead white with a yellowish tinge, and hung over his forehead and ears. His features were very pale, lined, and seamed with age and suffering, so that Isabella felt a twinge of sympathy for him, until the light caught his eyes. With a small jolt of intense distaste, she recognised those eyes. Once she had been with her father on a chartered fishing boat out of Black River. Shaza had been trolling a live bonito along the oceanic drop-off under the shadow of Le Mont Brabant, on the island of Mauritius, when he had hooked into a gigantic mucko shark. After a battle which lasted two hours, he had dragged the creature alongside. As its pointed snout broke through the surface, Isabella had been leaning over the rail, and she had looked into its eyes. They were black and pitiless, without definite iris or pupil, two holes that seemed to reach down into hell itself. Those were the same eyes that studied her now. She held her breath under their implacable scrutiny, until at last the man spoke. Then his voice came as a surprise. It was low and hoarse. She had to lean forward slightly to make sense of the words. Isabella Courtney, from now on we will never use that name again in any communication. You will be referred to, and you will refer to yourself only as Red Rose. Do you understand? She nodded, not trusting her voice to reply. He lifted the cigarette that smouldered between his fingers and drew deeply upon it. He spoke again through a cloud of exhaled smoke. I have a message for you in the form of a videotape recording. He stepped down from the dais and took the chair at the end of the row furthest from her. As he settled into it, the overhead lights dimmed. She heard the faint hum of electronic equipment, and then the screen lit up. The scene it displayed was a bare white tiled room, a laboratory or an operating theatre, she decided. There was a table in the centre of the room, and on it was a glass-sided tank, much like one of the aquariums in which ornamental tropical fish were displayed in a pet shop. The tank was filled with water to within a few inches of the top. On the tabletop beside the tank stood some sort of electronic cabinet and array of instruments and medical paraphernalia. She recognised a portable oxygen cylinder and an oxygen mask. The mask was a diminutive model suitable for infants and very small children. A man was busy at the table. His back was towards the camera and his features were hidden. He wore some type of white laboratory coat. He turned to face the camera, and Isabella saw that he wore a cloth theatre cap and surgical mask. His voice was dispassionate as he began to speak, and his accent was foreign, East European. He seemed to be addressing Isabella directly out of the screen. Your orders were to speak to nobody, not in Malaga or elsewhere. You deliberately disobeyed those orders. He was staring at her from the screen with disembodied eyes. I'm sorry, she replied as though he could hear her. I was so worried I couldn't... Silence, hissed one of the women behind her chair. A hand fell on her shoulder, fingers dug into her flesh with a strength that made her wince. On the screen the man was still speaking. You were warned that your disobedience would have dire consequences for your son. You chose to ignore that warning. What you are about to witness is a first demonstration of the seriousness of those instructions. He made a gesture to somebody off camera, and a figure entered from the side. It was impossible to tell whether it was a male or a female, for it also wore a cloth cap and surgical mask that covered all the face and head except for the narrow strip across the eyes. A full-length surgical gown fell to below the knees and was tucked into the tops of white rubber boots. This is a qualified doctor who will monitor all the proceedings, he explained. The figure carried a bundle in its arms. Only when it deposited the bundle on the table beside the glass-sided tank and a tiny bare leg kicked free of the swaddling cloth, Isabella realised that it was a child. With quick, trained hands, the doctor unwrapped the infant 
and the video camera zoomed in on Nicky as he lay naked on the tabletop, kicking his legs in the air, and his gurgles sounded in the quiet room. Isabella thrust the fingers of one hand into her mouth and bit down on them hard to prevent herself crying out again. The doctor placed two small black suction caps on Nicky's bare chest. Thin wires dangled from them, and the doctor connected them to the electronic cabinet and switched it on. The digital figures in the panel lit with a green glow, and the narrator explained in a neutral voice, The child's breathing and heartbeat will be recorded. The doctor looked up from his equipment and nodded. The narrator moved around behind the table and faced the camera. You are Red Rose, he said with peculiar emphasis on the name, and in future you will obey all orders given to you by that name. He reached down and took both of Nicky's ankles in one hand and lifted him. Nicky let out a squawk of surprise as he hung head down like a small pink wingless bat. You are about to witness the consequences of disobedience. He swung the child and held him head down over the glass-sided tank. Nicky arched his back and tried to lift his head. He waved his arms and clenched and unclenched his fists, making small noises of uncertainty and alarm. Slowly the narrator lowered the child head first into the water, and the sounds of his little voice were cut off abruptly. The video camera zoomed in through the glass side of the tank and focused on his face below the surface of the water. The colour resolution of the film was true to life. Isabella screamed wildly and tried to struggle out of her chair. The two women seized her from behind and forced her down again. On the screen, Nicky struggled in the narrator's grip. Underwater, his face was contorted and silver bubbles streamed from his nostrils. His face seemed to swell and darken. Isabella was still screaming and fighting when on the screen the masked doctor looked up quickly from the heart monitor and said sharply, in Spanish, Stop! That is enough, comrade. Immediately the man lifted the child clear of the tank. Water streamed from Nicky's nostrils and open mouth, and for long seconds he could not utter a sound except for his tiny gasping breaths. The narrator laid him down on the table, and the doctor clapped the oxygen mask over his swollen face and pressed down on his chest with the palm of his hand to induce regular breathing. Within a minute the digital readout on the cabinet had settled back to normal, and Nicky's movements were stronger. He howled into his mask with shock and outrage, his voice becoming louder and stronger with each cry. The doctor removed the mask and stepped back from the table. He nodded at the narrator. Once again he seized Nicky's ankles and lifted him over the tank. Nicky seemed to realise what was coming. His cries of protest reached a higher, terrified pitch. He kicked and writhed in the man's grip. He's my son! Isabella screamed. You can't! You mustn't do this to my baby! The narrator lowered Nicky's head once again below the surface, and the child fought with all his strength. His frenzied exertions racked the tiny body. Water splashed over the edge of the tank, and once again his face changed colour swiftly. Isabella screamed at him. Stop it! I'll do anything you say. Just stop torturing my baby, please. Please! Once again the doctor intervened with a sharp warning, and this time, when Nicky was lifted clear of the water, his movements were weaker. He made little choking, cawing sounds, and a mixture of water and vomit erupted from his open, inverted mouth, and silver strings of mucus slid down from his flared nostrils. The doctor worked swiftly, his alarm apparent, and he said something to the other man. The narrator looked up at the camera, seeming to stare directly at Isabella. We almost miscalculated that time. We exceeded the limit of safety. He and the doctor put their heads closer together and spoke so softly that Isabella could not catch the words, and then the narrator addressed her again. That concludes our demonstration for the time being. I sincerely hope that it will not be necessary for you to witness another like it. It would be harrowing for you to have to watch the amputation of the child's limbs without anaesthetic or eventually his strangulation in front of the camera. Of course, it will depend on you and the degree of cooperation that you are prepared to afford us. The image faded and the screen went blank.
There was no sound in the darkened theatre, except Isabella's sobs. These lasted for a long time. When they finally quietened, the lights were raised slowly, and Joseph Cicero came to stand over Isabella. I assure you that none of us takes any particular pleasure in this sort of thing. We will try to avoid any repetition. How could he do it? Isabella whispered brokenly. She was huddled down in the large chair. How could any human being do that to a child? I repeat, we do not enjoy the necessity. You must blame yourself, Red Rose. It was your disobedience that caused your son's discomfort. Discomfort? Is that what you call the torture of an innocent... Control yourself, Cicero warned her sharply. For your child's sake, control your insolence. I'm sorry, Isabella dropped her voice. It won't happen again. Just don't hurt Nicky again, please. If you cooperate, your son will not have to suffer further. He is in the care of a highly trained paediatric sister. He will receive the type of professional care that even you would not be able to give him. Later he will be given the best education that any boy or young man can hope for. Isabella stared up at him, her face twisted with misery. You speak as though he's been taken away from me forever. As though I'll never see my baby again. Cicero coughed and shook his head, struggled to regain his breath, and then whispered hoarsely, this is not the case, Red Rose. You will be allowed to earn the privilege of access to your son. To begin with, you will receive regular reports of his progress. You will be shown video recordings of how he develops, and when he first sits up, unaided, when he begins to crawl and to walk. Oh, no, she whispered. You can't keep him from me that long. It will be months. Cicero went on as though she had not spoken. Later you will be allowed to spend time with him each year. It is possible that sometime in the future, if your conduct is satisfactory, <coughs> you will be <coughs> allowed to spend holidays together. Days, even weeks in your son's company. No, her voice was a pitiful sob. You can't be so cruel as to keep us apart. Who knows? It is not beyond the bounds of possibility that one day we may remove all restrictions and allow you free access. <laughs> For that to happen... Though you would have to earn our complete trust and gratitude. Who are you? Isabella asked in a small, subdued voice. Who is Ramon Machado? I thought I knew him so well, and yet I did not know him at all. Where is Ramon? Is he part of all this monstrous... Isabella's voice broke, and she could not continue. You must put aside all thoughts of that nature. You must not seek to find the answer to the question of who we are, Cicero warned her. Ramon Machado is under our control, and do not expect help from him. The child is his also. He is under the same constraint as you are. What must I do? What do you want of me? Isabella asked. And Cicero nodded with satisfaction. There had been a remote chance that the woman might prove headstrong and uncontrollable. A psychiatrist's report on her had mentioned that possibility, but Cicero had never placed much credence in it. The hook on which they had hung her was sharp and fiercely barbed. Even if the child died, they would find a replacement to act in the video games and keep her dangling on the hook. No, he had expected her to be compliant, and those expectations had been vindicated. First, I must congratulate you, Red Rose, on your doctorate. It will make your work for us easier. Isabella stared at him. It was difficult for her to make the mental leap from this terrifying world of torture and espionage back to the prosaic consideration of her studies and academic honours. She had to concentrate to keep up with what he was saying. You will return as soon as possible to Cape Town and your family, after making arrangements at the university to receive your doctorate in absentia. Do you understand? Isabella nodded not yet trusting herself to speak. On your return home, you will begin to take more interest in all the family activities. You will work to make yourself indispensable to your father. You will make yourself his assistant and confidant in all things, but especially in his new position as head of the Armaments Corporation. What is more, you will begin to take an active interest in South African politics. My father 
is a self-contained man. He does not need me. You are wrong, Red Rose. Your father is a very lonely and basically unhappy man. He is incapable of a lasting relationship with any woman, except your grandmother, his mother, Santon Courtney Malcolm S., and with you, his daughter. He needs that relationship very, very deeply. And you will give it to him. You want me to use my own father? she whispered, horror blending with fresh horror in her eyes. For the survival of your son, Cicero agreed softly. No harm will come to your father, but your son stands full in harm's way, <laughs> unless you cooperate. Isabella took a handkerchief from her handbag and blew her nose. Her voice was soggy. You want me to inveigle myself into my father's confidence? To gain information on the National Armaments Programme and, and pass it on to you? You learn quickly, Red Rose. However, that is not all. You will use your father's political contact within the South African nationalist regime to foster your own political career within the party. She shook her head. I am not a political creature. You are now, Cicero contradicted her. You have a doctorate in political theory. Your father will introduce you to the corridors of power. Again she denied it. My father is in political eclipse. He backed the wrong horse when John Forster came to power in South Africa. That was why he was shunted into the ambassadorial post here, into political oblivion. Your father has exonerated himself by the way he performed his duties here in London. His appointment to such a responsible position as head of arms corps is indication of that. We anticipate that soon he will be totally reinstated within the party. We deem it highly probable that within two years he will once more be a member of the cabinet. You, Red Rose, will ride upon his back. In twenty years from now, you yourself could be a minister of the government. Twenty years? Isabella echoed in disbelief. Is that how long I, I must be your slave? <laughs> you still don't understand, Cicero asked, shaking his head. Let me explain it to you. You belong to us, Red Rose. You, your lover, Ramon Machado, and your son, forever. For many minutes, Isabella stared sightlessly at the blank screen, contemplating the enormity of the vision that he had conjured up for her. Joe Cicero broke the silence. His voice was almost gentle. You will be taken back now. They will leave you where they found you, on the embankment. Follow your orders, Red Rose, and in the long run it will work out well for you and your son. The women attendants helped Isabella to her feet and led her to the door. When she had gone, the side door to the lecture theatre opened and Ramon Machado stepped through. You were watching? Joe Cicero asked. And Ramon nodded. I congratulate you. Joe murmured reluctantly. It has been well run. We may reap much of value from this operation. How is the child? He suffered no ill effects. He and his nurse have arrived in Havana. Joe Cicero lit another cigarette and coughed and sat down heavily in one of the plastic chairs. Perhaps, he thought, just perhaps... I will be able to leave the department in capable hands. Amber Joy was about to fail to find. They could all see it. A palpable air of tension and expectation hung over the entire field of the trial. The South African Retriever Championship trial was being conducted over the foothills of the Kabonkelberg along the western end of the Veldtfrieden estate. The terrain was testing, and over the two days of the trials, the field of dogs had been whittled down to these four still in the hunt. The birds were mallard ducks, pen-reared on Feltafrieden, and placed in the field under the supervision of the judges prior to each retrieve. This would probably be the last occasion on which they would be allowed to use mallards, Shaza Courtney reflected. The conservationists were kicking up such a terrible stink about unshot mallards escaping into the wild. 
There, these exotic birds were highly attractive to the indigenous yellow-billed ducks. Avian Don Juans, he smiled. The progeny of these illicit unions were hybrids, and the Department of Nature Conservation had proclaimed a ban on the release of mallards, which would become effective at the end of the month. Thereafter, they would be forced to use ring-neck doves, or guinea fowl, which was a pity, they all agreed. These terrestrial birds did not float well on the water retrieves. Shaza Courtney switched his full attention back to the retrieve in progress. Amber Joy was the main competition to Felder Frieden's hopes of carrying off the cup for the first time. Amber Joy was a splendid yellow Labrador. His sire had been American field trial champion for three years in a row. Up until now, every single retrieve that he had made during the last two days had been SOB, straight out and back. This time, fortune had turned against him. The mallard had risen from its cage and flashed away along the edge of the dam. Gary, Courtney and Shaza were the field guns, chosen for the task because both of them were renowned shots. The mallard was flying left, Gary's side, and he had let it go to fifty yards before killing it so cleanly that it folded its wings and went in head first like a kamikaze. It fell close in to the reed beds amongst the lily pads and vata blomikis, the flowering aquatics that infested most dams in the Cape of Good Hope. The mallard's plunge drove it deep, and it had not re-emerged. Probably it was entangled with the plant stems below the surface of the muddy brown water. The judge had called Amber Joy's number, and Bunty Charles, his owner and handler, had sent him away. While the spectators crowded the dam wall to watch, the dog had taken to the water and swam out towards the spot where the mallard had disappeared. However, he had deviated from the true line as he swam, going up above the bird where any blood would drift away from him on the faint current set up by the inflowing river and the gusty southeaster which was sweeping across the open water. Now Amber Joy was paddling around amongst the reeds in erratic circles, occasionally ducking his head below the surface, but each time coming up with empty jaws and a little further from the spot where the duck had plunged. His efforts were causing consternation on the bank. Bunty Charles was dancing from one leg to the other in frustration. If he whistled and redirected Amber Joy onto the fall of the bird, he would lose points. There was still no guarantee that Amber Joy would find even with this assistance. On the other hand, time was running out. The three judges were already consulting their stopwatches. Amber Joy had been in the water for over three minutes. Bunty Charles flashed an anxious glance at the next handler and dog in the line. Santon Courtney Malcolm S. and Dandy Lass of Felter Frieden were his most bitter rivals. Up to now, he and Amber Joy had managed to hold them off, but only by ten points. If they failed to find, they would certainly forfeit their hard-won lead. Santon Courtney was also under intense strain. She did not have Bunty's thirty years of field trial experience. She had taken to the sport only recently yet she had brought all her immense energy and powers of concentration to it. Dandy Lass was the progeny of champions, a leggy golden retriever. She was bred for speed as a working gun dog, strong and wiry, unlike the heavier show dogs with their classical points of breed, but with their working instincts bred out of them. Dandy Lass had the heart and instinct to enter the heaviest cover or coldest water and work through it like a heroine. She had a fine nose to pick up the faintest scent a feather on the air, and her intelligence was uncanny. She and Santan had developed an almost telepathic rapport. Although she stood erect and utterly still, with her face calm and imperturbable, inwardly Santan was seething with agitation, and Dandy Lass picked it up from her. The judges would notice any word or gesture of restraint between them, and mark them down immediately. However, Dandy Lass was sitting on the live coals of her eagerness. Her fluffy golden bottom barely came in contact with the ground, and she switched from haunch to haunch with tiny excited movements not quite sufficient to incur the judge's wrath and penalty points. Whining or barking were grounds for instant elimination. With huge effort, Dandy prevented herself from giving tongue as she watched Amber Joy's frenzied efforts to find the bird. Yet her entire body shivered with eagerness, and the suppressed cries of excitement rumbled in her throat as she awaited her turn. 
Every few seconds she glanced up at Santon with imploring eyes, begging for the command to go. Shaza Courtney watched his mother from his place in the gun line. As always, she evoked in him the most profound sense of admiration. Santon Courtney Malcolm S. had turned 70 years old last New Year's Day. She had been named for her birth on the first day of the 20th century, and yet she was as slim and straight as a teenage boy. The outline of her legs and buttocks under fine woolen cloth were aristocratic and elegant. Who else would wear Chanel slacks to a field trial, he smiled, and her boots were of ostrich skin, handmade by Hermes of Paris. Of Paris. Of Paris. Of Paris. Single-handed, she had raised Shaza from infancy, when Shaza's father had been killed in action in France before his birth. Alone in the desert, she had discovered the first diamond that had led to the establishment of the fabulous Hani mine. For thirty years, she had run the mine and built up the sprawling financial empire that was to become Courtney Enterprises. Even though the chairmanship had passed to Shaza and then to her grandson, Gary Courtney, Santan still regularly took her seat on the board. Every word she uttered from that seat, every thought she expressed, was received with the utmost attention and respect. Every member of the family, from Shaza himself to Gary's brood of her great-grandchildren, aged between four years and a few months, stood in total awe of Santan Courtney. She was the only one who could give orders to Bella Courtney and have them obeyed without argument or question. She stood bareheaded in the bright sunshine of a golden day of Cape Spring, with the pedigree bitch squatting beside her, and the sunlight sparkled on her hair. Her hair was one of her finer points, dense and thick, and curling still, cut into a short cap, the colour of gunmetal touched with bright inlays of pure platinum. She held her chin high, and the set of her head alert. The years had not eroded her beauty, but had transformed it into a dignified serenity. Time may have withered that flawless skin, but had been unable to affect the strong line of her jaw, the proud cheekbones and the high, intelligent forehead. Nor had it dimmed those dark eyes, eyes that could one moment reflect the ferocity of a cruel predator and the next moment shine with humour and wisdom. One hell of a lady, Shaza thought. Just look at her, as hungry to win as she was fifty years ago. One of the judges blew a single sharp blast on his whistle, and Bunty Charles's shoulders slumped with disappointment. Amber Joy had failed and was being recalled. Bunty Charles reinforced the recall with a blast on his own whistle and a brusque hand signal. Amber Joy came in obediently to the bank and lunged up out of the water. He shook himself, throwing a crystal curtain of water droplets into the sunlight, and then, to the horror of his owner and the amusement of the spectators, lifted one leg and gave the nearest clump of reeds a contemptuous squirt, succinct expression of Amber Joy's opinion of the duck, the dam, and the judges. Such an unbridled display, while under judges' orders, was considered very poor form, and would certainly attract penalty points. However, Amber Joy was the picture of nonchalance, as he trotted back to his owner, lolling his tongue and wagging his sodden tail. At this stage, Dandy Lass was in a turmoil of eagerness. She was shivering wildly, rolling her eyes like a berserker. She knew she would be called next, and the effort of keeping her backside pressed to the ground and maintaining her seat was destroying her from within. Without looking down at her, Santan exerted all her powers of telepathic communication to hold the bitch under control. The judges were sadistically relishing the delay, making a pretense of consulting each other and writing up their notes, but in reality testing Dandy Lass to the outside limit of her endurance. If she broke now, she would be instantly eliminated. A whine or a bark would penalise her cruelly. Bastards, Santan thought bitterly. I ate every last man-jack of you. Let my darling go. Let her go. A faint choking whine escaped through Dandy's lips, a sound as though a bullfrog was being attacked by a swarm of bees under a blanket. And without seeming to move, Santan extended her forefinger down the side seam of her Chanel slacks, and Dandy suppressed her next utterance. The senior judge looked up from his notebook. Thank you, number three, he called across the water. 
and Santan said sharply, Fetch! And Dandy Lass went away like a golden javelin launched from the sling. As she came to the water, she folded her forelegs under her chest and went out from the bank in a stylish leap, like a thoroughbred steeplechaser, and hit the water three paces out, clear of the weeds. She came up swimming, and Santan's chest swelled with pride, only a true champion committed to water with such dash. Dandy Lass swam like an otter, snaking through the water, leaving a broad V of ripples across the surface. Then the swelling in Santan's chest turned to a cold weight of dread, as she realised that Dandy was making the same mistake as Amber Joy. Perhaps the long delay had unsighted her, but she was veering slightly across the wind and the current, up into the blind spot where the scent would be carried away from her. For an instant, Santan considered forfeiting points by redirecting her bitch. If Dandy found, even with assistance, she would still have wiped Amber Joy's eye, but they needed every single point if they were to win, and Santan could already taste the sweetness of victory on the back of her tongue. She stood motionless, her whistle dangling on the loop around her neck. Dandy Lass judged the length of the retrieve to within feet, and she circled once on the edge of the far reed bank, but she was still too high by three yards. Where Amber Joy had ploughed on, getting even further from the bird, Dandy Lass stopped and, treading water, looked back to where Santan stood on the far bank. Deliberately, Santan thrust her left hand into the hip pocket of her slacks. Not even the strictest judge, with the eyes of an eagle, could have construed that tiny movement as a signal. But Shaza picked it up. Ah, the old girl hasn't changed, he shook his head, grinning. Anything to win, any weapon in the arsenal, and the only sin is being caught out. In the water, Dandy Lass immediately turned left, down current, paddling hard, and two seconds later her nose went up as she acknowledged scent. She made one more circle, with the scent of the blood rich and hot in her nostrils, as she placed the fallen mallard, then she ducked her head into the cold brown water. A roar of approval went up from the bank, and she lifted her head again, streaming water, ears flat against her skull, but the carcass of the mallard held in her jaws. She left an arrowhead of ripples behind her as she headed back to the bank, the bird held neatly, wings folded, keeping it high to avoid drag through the water. As her feet touched bottom, Dandy Lass flew up the bank. She did not even pause to shake herself. Not wasting a second, she went in to make her delivery. As she dropped to sit in front of her mistress, Shaza felt a choke in his throat, and his vision misted over. It was beautiful, he thought, to see that kind of rapport between a woman and a dog. Santon took the caress from Dandy's mouth, and the iridescent patches in the wings burnt like sapphires in the sunlight. She handed it to the judge, and he examined it carefully, parting the feathers to check for teeth marks for any sign of hard mouthing and Santan held her breath until the judge looked up again and nodded. Thank you, number three. Not only had Santan Courtney Malcolm S. provided the venue for the trials, but she was, in addition, the hostess for the prize-giving ceremony. The candy-striped marquee tent, able to accommodate 500 guests, was set up on the main polo field of the estate, and from Felterfrieden's kitchens had come the gargantuan array of fine foods. The rock lobster had been caught by the fishing boats of Courtney Fishing and Canning Company at Lambert's Bay. The turkey had been raised on Felterfrieden. The succulent Karoo lamb came from Dragon's Fountain, the Courtney sheep station on the Candiboo plains of the Karoo. And the wines were from the vineyards that began at the edge of the polo field outside the marquee tent. The Prime Minister, John Forster, had agreed to present the prizes. This was the fruit of Santon's machinations over the years a less than subtle hint to the world that the Courtneys were no longer a spent political force, that the days of their eclipse were ending. Shaza Courtney had been a member of the faction within the Favut cabinet that had opposed John Forster's elevation to the premiership, and in consequence he had been sent into political exile. But over the years that he had been in London, Santan had laboured with all her finesse and skill within the party to seek her son's rehabilitation. Of course, the fact that Shaza's term in London had been such an unequivocal triumph had reinforced her efforts. However, much of the credit for the Arms Corps appointment redounded directly to Santan's tireless lobbying, her refusal to accept defeat, 
and the blatant wielding of all her political and financial influence in her son's favour. She would see to it that John Forster's presence on the Felterfrieden estate heralded a new golden era for the Courtenays. His round red face was the rising sun of their hopes and aspirations, Santan thought comfortably, as she looked around the crowded marquee. They were all gathered here at Felterfrieden once again, all the power brokers and the power wielders, although none of them had ever been so foolish or so reckless as to give Santan Courtney Malcolm S direct offence or to write her off completely. There had been a period of cooling off while Shaza had been serving his term in London. Some had been cooler than others, Santan reflected, with a steely glint in her eye, as she picked them out amongst the crowd. And she would remember them. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer, she thought with deep satisfaction. And almost as if to echo her sentiment, the chairman of the South African Kennel Union rose to his feet and called for silence from the dais at the far end of the marquee. After welcoming the Prime Minister and spending a few minutes discussing the field trial scene in general, the chairman began calling the prize winners to the stand, and the line of glistening silver trophies dwindled until only one remained in the centre of the green baize-covered table. But it was the tallest and most ornate of them all, with a statuette of a gun-dog on point surmounting the pinnacle. We come at last to the champion dog of trial, the chairman beamed around the tent, until he picked out Santan standing at the back of the tent, surrounded by her family. And it gives me much pleasure to call to the champion's birth, for the first time, a lady who in the few short years since she has taken to our sport has brought to it so much energy and enthusiasm that her contribution equals and in many cases surpasses those who have spent a lifetime working with gun dogs. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to welcome Mrs. Santan Courtney Malcolm S. and Dandy Lass of Felterfrieden. Isabella had been waiting outside the tent with Dandy Lass on leash, and now she came in with her, and while the crowd applauded, Isabella handed the dog over to her grandmother. Dandy Lass wore a fitted blanket in daffodil yellow, and Santan's racing colours, and with the Courtney insignia, a stylized silver diamond embroidered in one corner. She fell in beside her mistress, healing perfectly, as Santan started up towards the dais. The crowd laughed and applauded. Woman and dog made an elegant pair of thoroughbreds, and Dandy Lass grinned and lolled her tongue and wagged her tail at the fun of it. On the dais, Dandy Lass curtsied politely in front of the Prime Minister, and at a word from Santan offered him her right paw. The crowd loved it when John Forster stooped to shake the proffered paw. As he handed Santan the enormous silver trophy, the Prime Minister smiled at her. For a man with such a formidable reputation for ruthless strength and granite resolve, his smile was boyishly infectious, and his blue eyes twinkled. As he shook Santan's hand, he leant a little closer, so that she alone could hear his words. Don't you and your family find the unbroken success in everything you do become monotonous, Santan? he asked. They had come to first-name terms only in the last year or so. We try to be brave about enduring it, Uncle John, she assured him gravely. The Prime Minister made a short and uncontroversial speech of congratulation and then circulated around the Marquis with the alacrity of an adroit political gamesman. Smiling and shaking hands and passing on, he reached the end of the tent where Santan was holding court. Once again, my congratulations, Santan. I wish I could stay longer to help you celebrate your famous victory. He glanced at his wristwatch. You have been generous with your time, Santan agreed. But before you leave, may I introduce the only one of my grandchildren whom you have not met? She beckoned to Isabella, who was hovering close by. Isabella has been in London, serving as hostess to Shaza during his term at South Africa House. Africa House. Africa House. Africa House. As Isabella came forward, Santan was watching the Prime Minister's craggy bulldog features attentively. She knew that Forster was no philanderer. He could never have reached his position in the iron Calvinistic coils of his party if he had been. But despite the fact that for thirty years he'd been happily and securely married, he was still very much a man, and no man could remain unmoved when he looked at Isabella Courtney for the first time. Santan saw the shift in his gaze, and the way he hid his quick flare of attention 
behind that formidable frown. Santan and Isabella had planned for this meeting with care, ever since Isabella had amazed both Santan and Shaza by her sudden declared intention to enter the political arena. She'll get over it, Shaza predicted. But Santan had shaken her head. Bella has changed. Something has happened to her since she went to London with you. She went as a flighty, spoiled little bitch. Oh, come on, Mater. Predictably, Shaza had risen to his precious daughter's defence, but Santan went on without check. But she has returned a mature woman. However, there is more than that to it. She has steel now. She has cutting edge. And there is something else. Santan had hesitated as she tried to define it. She has shed her romantic view of life. It is as though she has experienced a revelation, as though she has suffered and learnt to hate, as though she has come through some portentous crisis and armed herself for whatever lies ahead. Now, it's not like you to make these fanciful flights of imagination, Shaza had chaffed her. But Santan had insisted. You mark my words. Bella has found her direction and she will prove herself as tough and ruthless as any of us. Surely not as tough and ruthless as you, Mater. <laughs> Have your little joke, Shaza Courtney, but time will prove me right. Santan's eyes had gone out of focus and squinted slightly. Shaza knew that expression so well when his mother indulged in furious concentration. He called them her scheming eyes. Then her eyes came back into focus. She is going far, Shaza, probably further than even you and I could dream, and I am going to help her. And so Santan had arranged this meeting, and now she watched her granddaughter acquit herself with all the aplomb that she had expected of her. Forster asked Isabella, So, how did you enjoy the English winters? And it was clear that he expected a trivial response. But Isabella said, it was worth putting up with them, if only to meet Harold Wilson, and to have a first-hand account of the Labour government's attitude and intentions towards all of us who live in southern Africa. Forster's expression changed as he realised that there was a brain behind that lovely face. He dropped his voice, and they talked quietly for a few minutes longer, before Santan intervened again. Isabella has just received her doctorate in political theory from London University. Artlessly, she tossed out a little more ground bait. Ah, oh, sir, Forster nodded. Do we have a budding Ellen Sussman in our midst? He was referring to the only woman member of the South African Parliament, the staunchest champion of human rights, and the only really galling liberal thorn in the complacently thick hide of the nationalist majority. Isabella laughed, that husky sexual chuckle, which she knew could stir even the most hidebound misogynist. Perhaps, she agreed. <laughs> A seat in the house might be my ultimate ambition, but that is still a far away ahead, and I don't think I'd be as naive as Mrs. Sussman, Prime Minister. My politics is very much in tune with that of my father and my grandmother, which, of course, made her a conservative. And now Forster's regard was sharp, blue, and attentive as he studied her. The world is changing, Prime Minister. Santan seized the moment. One day there may even be a place in your cabinet for a woman, don't you think? Forster smiled and switched easily from English into Afrikaans. Even Dr. Courtney agrees that day is still very far ahead. However, I do concede that such a pretty face would do much to lighten the deliberations of us ugly old men. The change of language was, of course, a test. Nobody in South Africa with political aspirations could survive without fluency in Afrikaans, the language of the politically dominant group. Isabella switched as easily as he had done. Her vocabulary was wide, her grammar perfect, and her accent rang sweetly, even in the ear of a born Afrikaner. Forster smiled again, this time with pleasure, and continued the conversation for a few minutes, before glancing pointedly at his wristwatch and speaking to Santan. I must go now, I, uh, I have another function to attend, he turned back to Isabella. Dot seems, Dr. Courtney, until we meet again. I will be watching your progress with interest. Santan and Shaza walked with him from the marquee to where his official car and driver waited on the edge of the polo ground. Dot seen, Santan, Forster shook her hand. I congratulate you on the rearing of your granddaughter. 
I recognize many traits which she can only have inherited from you. When Santan returned to the Marquis, she looked around quickly. Isabella was already the center of a circle of eager males. She has them panting like puppy dogs, Santan suppressed a smile, and caught her granddaughter's eye. Isabella left her admirers and came to her immediately, and Santan took her arm in a comfortable, proprietorial gesture. Well done, Missy. You behaved like a veteran. Uncle John likes you. I rather think that we are on our way. That evening, only the family sat down to dinner at the long table in Filterfrieden's main dining room. However, Santan had ordered the antique Limoges dinner service and the best silver. The table was resplendent in candlelight and a mass display of yellow roses. As was usual on these family evenings, the women wore long dresses and the men were in black tie. Only Sean was missing. Sean had been invited, or rather Santon had summoned him, but he was hunting with one of his most valuable clients on the Rhodesian concession and had sent his humble apologies. Santon had accepted them reluctantly. She had wanted them all to celebrate her triumph with Dandy Lass, but she conceded that business came first. The German industrialist that Sean was guiding paid for 63 days of hunting each year at $500 a day. Of course, his vast business commitments in Germany would not allow him to spend that much time in the hunting felt. He was lucky if he could fit in two weeks in any one year. However, he paid for the additional days to secure the right to hunt three elephant instead of one. Sean had to be on call for him, even though he usually gave only a few days' notice of his intended arrival. Santon missed her eldest grandson. Sean was the handsomest and wildest of the three of them, but his presence was always stimulating. He seemed to charge the very air around him with the static electricity of danger and excitement. It had cost her and the family tens of thousands of dollars to bail him out of the various scrapes that his tempestuous nature led him into. Although she always expressed her outrage at these expenditures in the severest terms, secretly she did not grudge them. Her only fear was that one day Sean would go too far and get himself into real trouble, from which even Santan would be unable to extricate him. She dismissed that thought. Tonight was not the night for morbid fancies. The tall silver trophy glittered in the centre of the long table. It stood on a pyramid of yellow roses. It was strange what satisfaction that bauble gave her. It had cost her countless hours of hard work in the field, but the winning had made it all worth while. It had always been like that for her. The burning need to excel was in her blood. She had passed on that divine contagion to those she loved. At the far end of the table, Shaza tapped the crystal glass in front of him with a silver spoon, and in the ensuing silence rose to his feet. He was tall and elegant in his impeccable dinner jacket and black tie. He began one of those speeches for which he was renowned easy and flowing, the wit and sentiment so cleverly timed and blended that he could at one moment raise a storm of laughter and at the next moisten every eye with a skilfully turned phrase. Although he heaped her with praise and turned the attention of every person in the room full upon her, Santon found her own mind wandering to her other grandchildren. They were all hanging on their father's lips, so engrossed by his words that they were unaware of Santon's appraisal. Gary sat at her right hand, as befitted his importance in the family hierarchy. From the runt of the litter, myopic, weedy and asthmatic, he had transformed himself, with little or no help from her or any of them, into this bull of power and confidence. Now he was the helmsman of the family fortune, chairman of Courtney Enterprises, his bulk threatening the fragile legs of the genuine Chippendale chair. His thumbs were hooked into the pockets of his discreetly brocaded waistcoat. His dress shirt was a snowy expanse over the great chest, and the starched wing collar too tight for a neck swollen not with fat, but with muscle and sinew. His dense black hair stood up in a coxcomb at the crown, and his thick horn-rimmed spectacles glittered in the candlelight. His laughter rocked the room, full and unrestrained. It greeted each of Shaza's sallies, and was so infectious that it transformed even his father's mildest remarks into wild hilarity. Santan switched her gaze to Gary's wife. Holly sat beside Shaza at the far end of the table. She was almost ten years Gary's senior. 
Santan had opposed the union with all her power and cunning. Of course, she had not succeeded in preventing the marriage. She admitted to herself now that it had been a serious error of judgment to attempt to do so. She would now have had more control and influence over Holly had she not made the attempt. Instead, she had raised barricades of mistrust in Holly's mind that she might never be able to pull down. She had been wrong about Holly. She had proved the perfect wife for Gary. Holly had recognised those qualities in him that none of them, not even Santan, had fully perceived. She had brought them to full flower and carefully nurtured his self-confidence. In large measure, she was responsible for Gary's success. She had given him strength and unflagging support. She had given him love and happiness, and she had given him three sons and a daughter. Santan smiled as she thought of those little scamps asleep in the nursery wing upstairs, and then sighed and frowned. The reserve that Holly still felt towards her was a barrier between her and her great-grandchildren. Gary and Holly lived in Johannesburg, the nation's financial centre, a thousand miles from Felterfrieden. The head office of Courtney Enterprises was in Johannesburg, as was the stock exchange. Gary was one of the main players. He had to be at the centre of the arena. Thus there was every reason for him and Holly to have left Felterfrieden. But Santown felt that Holly was keeping the children from her. Although it was only a three-hour flight in the company jet, which Gary loved to pilot himself, yet these days Santan very seldom saw them at Field of Rieden. She wanted desperately to have the children close to her, to guide and influence them, to protect and train them as she had their father. But Holly was the key. She would have to redouble her efforts to win her round. Now she deliberately caught her eye down the length of the long table, and smiled at her with all the warmth and affection she could convey. Holly smiled back, blonde and serene, her beauty given an extraordinary dimension by those party-coloured eyes, one blue, the other a startling violet. "'I will make you like and trust me yet,' Santan promised silently. "'You will not be able to hold out forever, not against me. I'll have those children. This family is mine. Those children are mine. You will not keep them from me much longer.' Shazza had said something about her that she had missed in her preoccupation. Now every head at the table was turned towards Santon, and they were all applauding with enthusiasm. She smiled and nodded her acknowledgement of whatever compliment Shazza had paid her. And as the applause faded, Shazza continued. You may have thought to yourselves, as you watched her handling Dandy Lass today, that it was a remarkable accomplishment. For any other woman it might have been so. But here we have the lady who faced down a man-eating lion with me as an infant strapped upon her back. Shaza was reciting once again all the old stories about her that were the weft and the warp of the family legend. In itself this recognition at every important occasion had become tradition, and though they had all heard them a hundred times, their enjoyment was as fresh as ever. Only one person at the table looked faintly embarrassed by the extravagance of Shaza's eulogy. Santown felt a chill little breeze of annoyance ruffle the silken surface of her self-satisfaction. Of all her grandchildren, the one for whom she felt the least warmth and concern was Michael. He sat near the centre of the long table at the lowliest position, not simply because he was the youngest of her grandsons. Michael did not fit into Santan's scheme of things. There were secret depths and hidden places in his nature that she had not yet fathomed, and which therefore annoyed her. She had never been able to wean Michael away from his natural mother, even the thought of Tara Courtney sent a scalding, acidic rush of hatred through Santan's bowels. Tara had outraged every principle and concept of decency and morality that Santan held sacrosanct. She was a Marxist and a miscegenist, a traitor and a patricide. A portion of Santan's feelings towards Tara were passed on to this one of her sons. 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 The force of her gaze must have been fierce enough for Michael to sense it. He glanced up at her suddenly and paled under Santan's dark eyes, and then looked away again hurriedly, almost guiltily. At Shaza's insistence, and over her objections, the family had acquired a controlling interest in the media company which counted amongst its assets the Golden City Mail newspaper. Shaza's motive had been to secure a place for Michael at the top of his chosen profession. His idea had been to build up the mail as a powerful and conservative voice of reason, 
and for Michael, once he had earned his spurs, to take over as publisher and editor. That day had not yet dawned, and Michael was still only a deputy editor. If it had been left to Shaza, he would have pushed Michael earlier. However, both Gary and Santan had kept his paternal indulgence in check. The two of them had reasoned that Michael was not yet ready for the job. His financial and administrative instincts were underdeveloped, and his political judgment was naive, perhaps irreparably flawed. It was Michael's influence on editorial policy that continually nudged the mail off the centre of the road, slanting it dangerously to the left, so that the newspaper had become distrusted not only by government, but also by the establishment of finance and mining and industry, those who paid for advertising space. On three previous occasions, the mail had been banned by government decree, each time at a financial cost that infuriated Gary and with a loss of prestige and influence that made Santan uneasy. He's not a true Courtney, Santan thought, as she studied Michael's pretty features. Even Bella has more steel in one of her little fingers than he has in his entire body. Michael is a waverer and a bleeder. His concern is for strangers and for the losers, not for the family. For Santan, that was the most heinous form of treachery. He doesn't take after any of us. He takes after his mother. And that was her most damning judgment. He has even tried to corrupt Bella. Santan knew about the presence of her two grandchildren at the anti-apartheid rally in Trafalgar Square. They had been photographed by South African intelligence from the windows of South Africa House, and Santan had received a warning call from one of her important contacts in the government. Fortunately, Santan had been able to smooth things over. Bella had done some undercover work for South African intelligence during her passionate love affair with Lota de la Rey. Lota had been a colonel in the police at the time, and he was now a member of Parliament and a deputy minister in the Ministry of Law and Order. Santan had called upon Lota personally. She had enormous influence over him. There were secrets that involved Lota's father and other mysteries which Lota could only guess at. In addition, Lota had been Bella's lover, and Santan suspected was still more than a little in love with her. I will include a full explanation of her presence at the rally in Isabella's file, Lota assured her. We know that she's a patriot. She has worked for us before, but I can't promise anything for Michael, Dante. Lota used the respectful term of address, which meant more than simple aunt. Michael has too many black marks on his file already, I'm afraid. Yes, thought Santon grimly. Michael has accumulated black marks, like a dog picks up fleas, and some of them hop off onto all of us. At that moment, Shaza finished his speech, and all of them turned towards Santon's end of the table, expectantly. As a speaker, she was every bit as good as her son, but there was often a little more of a sting in her words, and a little bit more directness in her views. They waited with anticipation for the customary fireworks as she began her reply. But tonight they were disappointed. Santan seemed in an unusually mild and benevolent mood. Rather than censure, she had praise and appreciation for all of them. Gary's financial results... Isabella's academic achievements, Holly's architectural plans for the new Courtney Luxury Hotel on the Zululand coast, and her forthcoming birthday. So sorry you won't be able to stay over with us for the big day, Holly darling. Even Michael came in for praise, albeit much fainter praise, with the publication of his most recent book. One doesn't have to agree with your conclusions, always the solutions which you suggest, Mickey dear, to appreciate just how much thought and hard work went into the writing of it. When she asked them to rise and drink a toast to our family and every single person in it, they responded with gusto. Then Shaza came to the head of the table to take her arm and lead her through into the blue drawing room where coffee and liqueurs and cigars were waiting. Santan would never accede to the barbarous custom of leaving the men alone with their cigars after dinner. If there was anything worth talking about, then she wanted to be part of those discussions. Quickly, Michael crossed to Isabella as she rose from her seat at the table and took her arm. I've missed you, Bella. Why didn't you answer my letters? There is so much I want to know. Ramon and Nicky. He saw her expression change, and his alarm was quick. Is something, is something wrong, Bella? Not now, Mickey, she warned him quickly. This was the first time they had spoken in almost six months. 
since Nicky had gone. She had not telephoned him or answered his letters. Moreover, she had avoided being alone with him ever since he had arrived at Felterfrieden that morning. There is something wrong, Michael insisted. Smile, she ordered him, smiling herself. Don't make a fuss. I'll come to your room later. No questions now. She squeezed his arm and laughed gaily as they all trooped through to the blue drawing room and clustered round attentively while Santan settled herself in her customary place on the long sofa facing the roaring log fire in the Adam fireplace. Let me have my girls with me tonight, she decided, and picked out Holly. Come and sit this side, my dear, she patted the sofa beside her. Bella, you on this side of me, please. Santan seldom did anything without good reason, and as soon as the servants had given them coffee and Shaza had poured cognac for the men, she played her high card. I have been waiting for a chance to do this, Holly, she said, in a voice that commanded all their attention, and I suppose... Your birthday is the best excuse I'll ever have. You are my eldest granddaughter, so I am going to establish a little family tradition tonight. Santa reached up behind her own neck and unclasped the necklace she wore and held it in her hands. A glittering treasure. Over a thousand carats of perfect yellow diamonds. Each stone had personally been selected by Santa and Courtney from the production of her fabulous Harney mine in the far north. It had taken ten years for her to accumulate them, and Garrards of London had designed and manufactured the setting in pure platinum. Something so lovely should only be worn by a beautiful woman, Santan whispered regretfully, and the tears that sparkled in her eyes were genuine. Alas, I no longer fill that requirement, so it is time for me to pass them on to somebody who does. She turned to Holly. Where are these... With joy, she said, and hung them at her throat. Holly sat as though stunned, and everybody in the room was silent with awe. They all knew what that necklace meant to Santan. They knew that she had placed a far higher value on it than the mere two million sterling which the Lloyd's assessors had recently decided was its intrinsic worth. Holly lifted her right hand and stroked the bright stars at her throat with a look of total disbelief on her delicate features. Then she choked and sobbed, and turned to saint Anne and embraced her. The two women clung together for a moment before Holly could find her voice. It was muffled and small, but all of them heard it clearly. Thank you, Nana. Only close members of the family called saint Anne that, and Holly had never done so before. Santan held her tightly, closing her eyes, and pressing her face against Holly's golden head, so that none of them would see the little smile of triumph on her lips and the satisfied gleam through the tears in her eyes. Nanny was waiting in Isabella's suite. "'It's after one o'clock!' Isabella exclaimed. "'I've told you not to wait up for me, you silly old woman. "'I've been waiting for you for twenty-five years!' Nanny came to unhook the back of her dress. It makes me feel terrible, Isabella protested. It makes me feel good, Nanny grunted. I don't feel happy less I know what you've been up to, Missy. I'll run your bath. Didn't do it before, didn't want it to turn cold. A bath at one o'clock in the morning? Isabella dismissed the idea strenuously. She had not allowed Nanny to see her naked since her return. The old woman's eyes were much too sharp. She would pick up the tiny changes that childbirth had wrought on Isabella's body, the darkening and enlarging of her nipples, the faint stria where the skin had stretched across her hips and lower belly. She sensed that Nanny was becoming suspicious at this change of behaviour, and to divert her she said, Off with you now, Nanny. Go and warm Bossy's bed for him. Nanny looked shocked. Who's been telling you scandal stories? she demanded. Are you not the only one who knows what's going on at Felterfrieden? Isabella informed her gleefully. Old Bossy has been after you for years. About time you took pity on him. He's a good man. Bossy was the estate blacksmith who had come to work for Santon as an apprentice thirty-five years ago. You go off and hammer his anvil for him. That's dirty talk, Nanny sniffed. A real lady doesn't talk dirty. Nanny tried to hide her confusion behind a prim expression but backed off towards the door, and Isabella sighed with relief as it closed behind her. 
She went through to her bathroom and swiftly removed her makeup, tossed her evening dress over the back of the sofa for Nanny to deal with in the morning, and slipped into a silk bathrobe. As she belted the robe, she crossed her bedroom and then paused with her fingers on the door handle. What am I going to tell Mickey? If she had asked herself that question only three days ago, the answer would have been obvious. But since then, circumstances had changed. The packet had arrived. The last communication she had received from Joe Cicero had been on the day before she left London to return to the Cape of Good Hope. He had telephoned her at Cadogan Square while she was in the process of packing. Red Rose! She had recognised the husky wheeze of his voice instantly, and as always it had frozen her with dread and loathing. I am going to give you a contact address. Use it only in an emergency. It is an answering service, so do not waste time and energy checking it. A telegram or letter addressed to Hoffman, care of Mason's Agency, 10 Blushing Lane, Soho, will find me. Memorise that address, do not write it down. I have it, Isabella whispered. On your return home, you will hire a post office box at a location not associated with the Welt of Frieden. Use a fictitious name and inform me at the Blushing Lane address when it is established. Is that clear? Within days of arriving back at Feltefrieden, Isabella had driven over the Constantiaberg Pass to the sprawling suburb of Camps Bay on the Atlantic seaboard of the Cape Peninsula. The post office there was far enough removed from Feltefrieden for none of the postal staff to recognise her. She hired the box in the name of Mrs Rose Cohen and sent a registered letter to Blushing Lane with this box number. She checked the box for a letter each evening as she returned from her office in Santon House in central Cape Town, driving the Mini over the neck between Signal Hill and the mountain, the more circuitous route around the back of Table Mountain, to reach Feltefrieden. Even though the box remained empty day after day and week after week, she never varied her routine. The lack of news of Nicky ate away at the fabric of her soul. The day-to-day -day events of her life seemed all a sham and a pretense. Although she channelled all her energy into her work as Shaz's assistant, the effort was not the opiate for her pain that she had hoped it might be. She smiled and laughed. She rode with Nana and at the weekends played tennis or sailed with her old friends. She worked and played as though everything was the same. But it was all acting. The nights were long and lonely. In the midnight hours she would resolve to go to Shaza and describe in detail the web in which she was enmeshed. But then in daylight she would ask herself, what can Peter do? What can anybody do to help me? And she remembered Nicky's swollen face and the silver bubbles streaming from his nose as he drowned, and she knew she could not risk that ever happening again. Strangely, the passage of time did not reduce the pain of her loss. Instead, it seemed to inflame her wounds, and the lack of news of Nicky aggravated them still further. Each day her suffering was harder to bear alone. Then she heard that Michael was coming down from Johannesburg to Feltefrieden for the trials, and it seemed fortuitous. Michael was the perfect confidant. She would not expect him to do anything except share her suffering and lighten the terrible load, which up until now she had carried alone. On the Friday before Michael's arrival, she had driven over the neck to Camps Bay and parked the Mini in the street beyond the post office. She walked back slowly and glanced into the side hall that housed the tiers of tiny steel post boxes. It was almost six in the evening, and the main post office was long ago closed. There were a couple of teenagers necking in the corner of the postal hall, but they scurried away guiltily as she glared at them. Isabella took the precaution of never approaching or opening her box while a stranger was in the hall. She glanced back at the entrance to make sure she was alone, and then inserted her key in the lock of the tiny steel door in the fifth row of tiered boxes. The shock was greater for the fact that she was expecting the box to be empty. Adrenaline squirted into her bloodstream, and she felt her cheeks burn and her breathing choke. She snatched up the thick brown envelope and crammed it into her sling bag. Then, as guilty as a thief, she slammed and locked the box and ran back to where the mini was parked. She was trembling so that she had difficulty fitting the key into the door lock. She was breathing as hard as though she had played a long rally on the tennis court as she started the mini and you turned back across the road. She parked above the beach under the palms that lined the drive. At this hour the beach was almost deserted, 
an elderly couple exercised an Irish setter at the edge of the water, and a single bather braved the southeaster and the icy green waters of the Benguela current. A current. A current. A current. Isabella rolled up the windows and locked both doors of the mini before she took the envelope out of her bag and held it in her lap. The address was typed. Mrs. Rose Cohen, and the Queen's Head postage stamps had been franked at Trafalgar Square Post Office. She turned the envelope over, reluctant to open it, terrified of what it might contain. There was no return address on the reverse. Still delaying the moment, she searched for the gold lady's penknife in her bag and carefully slit the flap of the envelope with its razor-edged blade. A coloured photograph slid out, and every nerve in her body tingled as she turned it face up and recognised her son. Nicky sat on a blue blanket on a garden lawn. He wore only a napkin. He was sitting up unsupported, and she reminded herself that he was nearly seven months old. He had grown. His cheeks were not so chubby, his limbs longer and sleeker. His hair was thicker and longer, curling darkly onto his forehead. His expression was quizzical, but there was a smile hovering at the corners of his mouth, and his eyes were bright and green as emeralds. Oh, God! He's more beautiful, she gasped, holding the photograph up to the light to study every tiny detail of his face. He's grown so big already, and sitting up on his own, my clever little mannequin. She touched the image, and then saw with consternation that she had left a fingerprint on the glossy surface of the photograph. She wiped it off carefully with a Kleenex. My baby, she whispered, and felt her loss tear at her heart with renewed ferocity. Oh, my baby! The sun had sunk to touch the line of the horizon far out on the Atlantic before she could rouse herself. Only then, as she returned the photograph to the envelope, did she realise that she had overlooked the other items it contained. First there was a photostat copy of a page from what was obviously a medical register at some child's clinic. But the name and address of the clinic had been obliterated. It was written in Spanish. His name was at the head of the sheet. Nicholas Miguel Ramon de Machado, followed by his date of birth and a record of weekly visits to the clinic. Each dated entry was in a variety of handwritings and signed by the clinic's doctors or sisters. It showed his weight and diet and dental records. She saw that on the 15th of July he had been treated for a rash that the doctor diagnosed as prickly heat, and two weeks later for a mild oral thrush. Otherwise he was healthy and normal. With a rush of maternal pride, she read that his first two teeth had erupted at four months, and he weighed almost sixteen kilos. Isabella turned to the last folded sheet of paper that the envelope contained and immediately recognised the handwriting. It was in Spanish, in Adra's firm, restrained hand. Signorita Bella, Nicky grows every day stronger and cleverer. He has a temper like one of the bulls of the Corrida. He can crawl on hands and knees almost as fast as I can run, and I expect that any day now he will rise up on his back legs and walk. The first word he spoke was Mama, and I tell him each day how beautiful you are and how one day you will come to him. He does not yet understand, but one day he will. I think of you often, Signorita. You must believe that I will care for Nicky with my own life. Please do not do anything to endanger him. Respectfully, Adra Olivares. The warning contained in the last line twisted like a knife between her ribs and was more urgent and poignant for being so mildly expressed. She knew then that she could never risk telling anyone, nor Pater, or Nana, or even Michael. She hesitated now with her hand on the handle of her bedroom door. I have to lie to you, Mickey, I'm sorry. Perhaps one day I'll tell you the truth. She listened for a moment, but the great house was silent, and she turned the handle and quietly swung the door open. The long gallery was deserted with only the night lights burning in their brackets on the wooden panelled walls. On bare feet, Isabella slipped silently over the Persian carpets scattered on the parquet floor. Since he was so seldom at Felterfrieden, Michael kept his old room in the nursery wing. He was sitting up in bed reading. As soon as she pushed the door open, he dropped the book on the bedside table and lifted the bedclothes for her. As she climbed in beside him, 
He tucked the eider down around her shoulders, and she clung to him, shivering with misery. They held each other for a long time in silence before Michael invited her gently. Tell me, Bella. Even then she could not say it immediately. Her good intentions wavered. She felt the desperate temptation to ignore Adra's warning. Mickey was the only one of the family who knew that Ramon and Nicky even existed. She wanted desperately to blurt it all out to him, and have his gentle warming comfort to help fill the terrible void in her soul. Then the image of Nicky that she had watched on the video film flashed before her eyes once more. She drew a deep breath and pressed her face to Michael's chest. Nicky is dead, she whispered, and felt him flinch in her embrace. He did not reply at once. It's true, she consoled herself silently. Nicky is dead to all of us now. And yet the words seemed a dreadful betrayal of Michael and of Nicky. She did not, dare not, trust him. She had denied the existence of her own son to him, and the falsehood seemed to increase her own misery and isolation, if that were possible. How? Michael asked at last, and she had anticipated the question. Cot death, she whispered. I went to wake him for his feed, and he was cold and dead. She felt Michael shiver against her. Oh, God, my poor Bella! How horrible, how cruel! The reality was crueler and even more horrible than he could imagine, but she could not share it with him. After a long minute he asked, Ramon? Where is Ramon? He should be here to comfort you. Ramon, she repeated the name, trying to keep fear out of her voice. When Nicky was gone, Ramon changed completely. I think he blamed me. His love for me died with Nicky. She found herself weeping now, hard, tearing sobs that expressed all the grief and terror and loneliness that had haunted her for so long. Nicky is gone. Ramon is gone. I will never see either of them again, not as long as I live. Michael hugged her tightly. His body was hard and warm and strong. Masculine strength that was completely devoid of sexuality was what she needed most. She felt it flowing into her like water, filling the depleted dam of her courage and fortitude, and she clung to him silently. After a while he began to talk. She lay and listened, her ear pressed to his chest, so that his voice was a reverberating murmur. He talked of love and suffering, of loneliness and of hope, and at last, of death. The true terror of death is its finality, the ending so abrupt the void beyond so irrevocable. You cannot challenge death or appeal against it. You only break your heart if you try. Platitudes, she thought. Old clichés. The same ones with which man has tried to console himself for tens of thousands of years. Yet, like most clichés, they were true, and they were the only comfort that she had available to her. More important than the sense of the words was the soft, lulling music of Michael's voice, the warmth and strength of his body, and his love for her. At last she fell asleep. She awoke before dawn and was immediately aware that he had lain all night without moving so as not to disturb her, and that he was awake also. Thank you, Mickey, she whispered. You'll never know how alone I have been. I needed that badly. I do know, Bella. I know what loneliness is. And she felt her heart go out to him her own pain temporarily assuaged. She wanted to be there for him now. It was his turn. Tell me about your new book, Mickey. I haven't read it yet, I'm sorry. He had sent her a pre-publication copy, lovingly inscribed, but she had been totally engrossed with her own suffering. There had been no time for anybody else, not even Mickey. So this time, while she listened, he talked about the book, and then about himself and his view of the world around them. I have spoken to Rally Tabaka again, he said suddenly, and she was startled. She had not thought of that name since she left London. Where? Where did you meet him? Michael shook his head. I did not meet him. We spoke on the telephone very briefly. I think he was calling from another country. But he will be here soon. He is a will-o'-the-wisp, a black pimpernel. He comes and goes across borders like a shadow. You have arranged to meet him? she asked. 
Yes, he's as good as his word. Be careful, Mickey. Please promise me you'll be careful. He's a dangerous man. Oh, there is nothing for you to worry about, he assured her. I'm no hero. I'm not like Sean or Gary. I'll be careful. Very careful. I promise you. Michael Courtney parked his battered valiant in the car park of a drive-in restaurant on an off-ramp of the main Johannesburg to Durban highway. He switched off the ignition, but the engine continued running on pre-ignition for a few unsteady beats. It had been missing badly all the way down from the offices of the Golden City Mail in central Johannesburg. The car had clocked up over 70,000 miles and should have been sold two years previously. As deputy editor, his contract stipulated that he was entitled to a new luxury vehicle every 12 months. However, Michael had developed an affection for the old Valiant. All its scars and scrapes had been honourably acquired, while over the years the driver's seat had taken on the contours of his body. He studied the other vehicles in the car park. But none of them answered the description he had been given. He glanced at his wristwatch, a Japanese digital for which he had paid five dollars on a trip to Tokyo for the newspaper the previous year. He was twenty minutes early at the rendezvous, so he lit a cigarette and slumped down in the comfortable shabby old seat. Thinking about the car and the watch made him smile. He really was the odd man out in his family. From Nana down to Bella, they were all obsessed with material possessions. Nana had her daffodil-coloured daimlers. The colour was always the same, although the model changed each year. Pater kept a garage filled with classic cars, mostly British sports cars like the SS Jaguar and the big six-litre touring Bentley in racing green. Gary had his fancy Italian Maseratis and Ferraris. Sean bolstered his tough-guy image with elaborately outfitted four-wheel-drive hunting vehicles, and even Bella drove a souped-up little thing that cost twice as much as the new Valiant. Not one of them would have worn a digital wristwatch. Not Nana with her diamond Piaget, nor Sean with his macho gold Rolex. Things, Michael's smile turned down at the corners of his mouth. All they see are things, not people. It's the sickness of our country. There was a tap at the side window of the Valiant, and Michael started and looked around, expecting his contact. There was nobody there. He was startled. Then a small black hand with a pink palm came into view and diffidently tapped on the glass with one finger. Michael rolled down the window and stuck his head out. A black urchin grinned up at him. He could not have been more than five or six years of age. He was barefoot, and his singlet and shorts were ragged. Although his nostrils were crusted with white flakes of dried snot, his smile was radiant. He please, boss, he piped and cupped his hands in a beggar's gesture. Me hungry, please give one cent, boss. Michael opened the door, and the child backed away uncertainly. Michael picked up his cardigan, which he had thrown on the seat beside him, and slipped it over the child's head. It hung down almost to his ankles, and the sleeves drooped a foot beyond his fingertips. Michael rolled them up for him and said in fluent causa, Where do you live, little one? The boy was obviously flabbergasted not only by this attention, but also to hear a white man speak causa. Six years before, Michael had realised that it was impossible to understand a man unless you spoke his language. He had been studying and practising it since then. Not one white in a thousand went to those lengths. All blacks were expected to learn either English or Afrikaans, otherwise they were virtually unemployable. Now Michael spoke both causa and Zulu. These languages were closely related, and between them covered the vast majority of the black population of southern Africa. I live at Drake's farm in Corsi. Farm in Corsi. Farm in Corsi. Farm in Corsi. Drake's farm was the sprawling black township which almost a million souls called home. From here it was out of view to the east of the highway, but the smoke from the thousands of cooking fires hazed the sky to a dirty leaden grey. The wage earners of Drake's Farm commuted daily by train or bus to their workplaces in the homes and factories and businesses of the white areas of the Witwatersrand. The huge commercial and mining complex of Greater Johannesburg was surrounded by these dormitory townships, Drake's Farm and Soweto and Alexandria. Under the bizarre conditions of the Group Areas Act, the entire country was divided up into areas reserved for each of the racial groups. When did you last eat? Michael asked the child gently. 
I ate yesterday in the morning, great chief. Michael took a five-rand banknote from his wallet. The child's eyes seemed to expand into a pair of luminous pools as he stared at it. He had almost certainly never possessed so much money at one time in his short life. Michael proffered the note. The child snatched it and turned and ran, tripping over the skirts of the dangling cardigan. He gave no thanks, and his expression was one of desperate terror, lest the gift be taken back from him before he could escape. Michael laughed with delight at his antics, and then suddenly his amusement turned to outrage. Was there another country in the modern First World, he wondered, where little children were still forced to beg upon the streets? Then mingled with his anger was a sense of utter hopelessness. Was there any other country that embraced both the members of the First World, like his own family, with its vast estates and stunning collection of treasures, and the desperate poverty of the Third World epitomised here in the townships? The contrast was all the crueller for being so closely juxtaposed. If only there was something I could do, he lamented, and drew so hard on his cigarette that a full inch of ash glowed, and a spark fell unnoticed onto his tie, and scorched a spot the size of a pinhead. It did not make much difference to the general appearance of his attire. A small blue delivery van turned off the main highway into the car park. It was driven by a young black man in a peaked cap. The sign writing on the body read, Fusa Mushli Butri, 12th Avenue, Drake's Farm. The name promised good eating. Michael flashed his lights as he had been instructed to do. The van pulled into the parking bay directly in front of him. Michael climbed out and locked the Valiant before he crossed to the blue van. The rear doors were unlocked. Michael climbed in and slammed them behind him. The body of the van was more than half filled with baskets containing packages of raw meat, and the skinned carcasses of a number of sheep hung from the hooks in the roof. Hey, come this way, the driver called to him in Zulu, and Michael crawled down the length of the body. The hanging carcasses brushed against him, and the drippings stained the knees of his corduroy bags. The driver had prepared a niche for him between two of the meat baskets, where he would be hidden from casual inspection. There will be no trouble, the driver assured him in cheerful Zulu. Nobody ever stops this van. He pulled away, and Michael settled down on the grubby floor. These theatrical precautions were annoying but necessary. No white was allowed into the township without a permit issued by the local police station in consultation with the township management council. In the ordinary course of events, this permit was not difficult to obtain. However, Michael Courtney was a marked man. He had three previous convictions for contravention of the Publications Control Act, for which he and his newspaper had been heavily fined. Under the Act, the government censors had been given almost unlimited powers of banning and suppression of any material or publication, and they were encouraged by the full caucus of the ruling National Party not to flinch from exercising those powers to uphold the Calvinistic moral views of the Dutch Reformed Church and to protect the political status quo. What chance, then, did Michael's writings have against their vigilance? Michael's application for a permit to enter Drake's Farm Township had been summarily rejected. The blue van entered the main gates of the township without a check, and the indolent uniformed black guards did not even glance up from their game of African Ludo, played with Coca-Cola crown tops on a carved wooden board. You can come up front now, the driver called, and Michael clambered over the meat baskets to reach the passenger seat in the cab. The township always fascinated him. It was almost like visiting an alien planet. It was back in 1960, almost 11 years ago, that he had last visited Drake's farm. At that time he had been a cub reporter for the Mail. That was the year in which he had written the Rage series of articles that were the foundation on which his journalistic reputation was built, and incidentally the grounds for his first conviction under the Publications Control Act. He smiled at the memory and looked around him with interest as they drove through the old section of the township. Now this dated from the previous century, the Victorian era during which the fabulous golden reefs of the Witwatersrand had been discovered close by. The old section was a maze of lanes and alleys and higgledy-piggledy buildings, shacks and shanties of unburnt brick and cracked plaster, of corrugated iron roofs painted all the shades of an artist's palette. Most of the original colours had faded and were running with the red leprosy of rust. 
The narrow streets were rutted and studded with potholes and puddles of indeterminate liquid. Scrawny chickens scurried and scratched in the litter of rubbish. A huge sow with a pink hide that looked as though it had been parboiled wallowed in one of the puddles and grunted irritably as the van passed. The stink was wondrous. The sour stench of ripening garbage mingled with that of the open drains and the earthen toilets that stood like sentry boxes behind each of the hovels. The government health inspector had long ago abandoned all hope of ever regulating the old section of Drake's farm. One day the bulldozers would arrive, and the mail would run front-page photographs of the distraught black families crouching on the pathetic piles of their worldly possessions, watching the brutal machines demolishing their homes. A white civil servant, in a dark suit, would make a statement on the state television network about this festering health hazard making way for comfortable modern bungalows. The anticipation of that day made Michael angry all over again. The blue van bumped and weaved over the rutted lanes, passing the dismal shabines and whorehouses, and then crossed the invisible line from the old into the new section that the same civil servant would describe as comfortable modern bungalows. Thousands of identical brick boxes with grey corrugated asbestos roofs stood in endless lines upon the treeless felt. They reminded Michael of the rows of white wooden crosses that he had seen in the military cemeteries of France. Yet somehow the black residents had managed to imprint their character and individuality upon this forbidding townscape. Here and there a house had been repainted, a startling colour in the monotonous grubby white lines. Pink or sky blue or vivid orange, they bore witness to the African love of bright colour. Michael noticed one that had been beautifully decorated in the traditional geometric designs of the Indibeli tribe from the north. The tiny front gardens were a mirror of the personal style of the occupants. One was a square of dusty bare earth, another was planted with rows of maize plants and had a milking goat tethered at the front door, yet another boasted a garden of straggly geranium plants in old five-gallon paint tins, while still another was fenced with high barbed wire and the weed-clogged yard was patrolled by a bony but ferocious mongrel guard-dog. Some of the plots were separated from each other by ornamental walls of concrete breeze blocks or old truck tyres painted gaudy colours and half buried in the brick-hard earth. Most of the cottages had extraneous additions tacked onto them, usually a lean-to of salvaged lumber and rusty corrugated iron into which a family of the owner's relatives had overflowed. There were abandoned motor vehicles, sans engine or wheels, parked at the curb. Hillocks of old mattresses, disintegrating cardboard boxes and other discarded rubbish, which the refuse removal service had overlooked, stood on the street corners. Across the stage moved the people of the townships. These were the people whom Michael loved more than his own race or class, the people with whom he empathised and for whom he agonised. They delighted him endlessly. They amazed him endlessly with their strength and fortitude and will to survive. The children were everywhere he looked, the crawlers and totterers and squawkers who rolled and roistered in the streets like litters of glossy black Labrador puppies, or rode high, strapped to their mother's backs in the traditional style. The older children played their simple games with wire and empty beer cans, which they had fashioned into toy automobiles. The little girls played with skipping ropes in the middle of the road or imitated the games of hopscotch and catch that they had seen the white children play. They were tardy and reluctant to give way and clear the roadway when the driver of the blue van hooted at them. When they saw Michael's white face, they danced beside the slow-moving van with cries of, Sweetie! Sweetie! Michael had come prepared, and he tossed them the hard sugar candy with which he had stuffed his pockets. Though most of the adult population had made the long daily journey to their workplace in the city, the mothers and the old people and the unemployed had been left behind. Gangs of street youths stared at him expressionlessly as he passed, gathered in idle groups on the littered street corners. Though he knew that these teenagers were the jackals of the townships who preyed upon their own kind, Michael's sympathy went out to them. He understood their despair. He knew that even before they had fairly embarked on life's journey, they were aware that it held nothing for them, no expectation or hope of better things or kinder times.
Then there were the women at their chores, hanging the long lines of laundry to dry like prayer flags on the breeze, or stooped over the black three-legged pots in the backyards, cooking the staple maize porridge of their diet over open fires in the traditional way, preferring that to the iron stoves in the tiny cottage kitchens. The smoke of the fires mingled with the blown dust to form the perpetual cloud that hung over the township. The illegal hawkers, or spuzas, who had eluded the Africana government's passion for regulations and licensing, wheeled their barrows and shouted their wares in the busy streets. The housewives bartered with them for a single potato or cigarette or orange or slice of white bread, depending on their circumstances. Despite these dreary surroundings and all the evidence of poverty and neglect, Michael heard in every street and at every corner they turned the sound of laughter and music. The laughter was spontaneous and merry. Their shouted greetings and repartee were carefree. Wherever he looked were those lovely African smiles that filled his heart and then squeezed it to the point of pain. The music rang and echoed from the bleak little cottages, and in the streets from the transistor radios that men and women carried in hand or balanced on their heads as they walked. The children played their penny whistles and banjos, made from paraffin tins and wood and pieces of wire. They danced and they sang in a spontaneous expression of the sheer joy of living, even in these most insalubrious circumstances. For Michael, the laughter and the music depicted the indomitable spirit of the black African in face of all hardship. For him there could not be another race on earth quite like them. Michael loved them, every one of them, no matter what age or sex or tribe or condition. He was of Africa, and these were his people. What can I do for you, my brothers? he whispered. What can I do to help you? I wish I knew. Everything I have attempted so far has failed. All my efforts have died like a hopeless shout upon the desert air. If only I could find a way. Then, abruptly, he was distracted. They topped a rise in the gently undulating felt, and Michael straightened in his seat. Eleven years ago, when last he had passed this way, there had been nothing but open grassland here, with a few scrawny goats grazing amongst the red wounds with which erosion and neglect had raked the earth. Nobs Hill, the driver of the van chuckled at his surprise. Beautiful, eh? Such is the determination and fortitude of men, that even in the face of the most adverse circumstances there are those few who will not only survive, but who with courage and ingenuity far beyond the average will flourish and rise high above the obstacles and pitfalls with which their path is strewn. Along the low ridge of ground, standing above the huddled shacks and cottages of Drake's farm, were the homes of the black elite. There were a hundred or so of these successful men set apart from all the million inhabitants of Drake's farm, through business acumen and natural ability and hard work, they had wrested material success from the hands of their white political masters, from those who had attempted to dictate their fate through the monumental framework of interlocking laws and regulations, which was the Favut-inspired policy of apartheid in action. Yet their victory over circumstances was hollow. No matter that they could afford to make their home in any part of this land, they were constrained by the Group Areas Act to live only in these areas which those architects of apartheid had set aside for them. The homes that these black businessmen and doctors and lawyers and successful criminals had built for themselves would have graced the elegant suburbs of Santon or La Lucia or Constantia, where their white counterparts lived. See, the driver of the van pointed proudly, their pink house with the big windows. It is the home of Josiah Nrubu, the famous witch doctor. He sells his charms and potions and spells by mail order all over Africa, even to Nigeria and Kenya. Nigeria and Kenya. Nigeria and Kenya. Nigeria and Kenya. He sells a charm to make all men and women love you, and lion bones to give you success in business and money matters. He can give you the fat of vultures for your eyesight, and another potion made from the hymen of a virgin that will make your meat plough hard as granite and tireless as a war assegai. He has four new Cadillac motorcars, and his sons go to university in America. Yeah, I'll take the lion bones, Michael chuckled. The Golden City Mail had run at a loss for the last four years, much to the chagrin of Nana and Gary. See, the house with the green roof and the high wall. There lives Peter Ngonyama. 
His tribe grows the weed that we call dacha, or boom, and which you whites call cannabis. They harvest the dacha in the uh, secret places in the hills and send it by the truckload to Cape Town and Johannesburg and Durban. He has 25 wives and is very rich. They left the crumbling surface of the old road for the smooth blue asphalt expanse of the newly laid boulevard. The driver accelerated down between the green lawns and high brick walls of Nobbs Hill, officially designated Drake's Farm Extension 4. Suddenly he braked and turned off to pause before steel gates of one of the more luxurious mansions. The electric gates slid aside silently and then closed again behind them as they drove through into a garden of planted shrubs and green lawns. There was a free-form swimming pool below the terrace, with a rock fountain at the centre. Sprinklers played upon the lawns, and Michael noticed two black gardeners in overalls working amongst the flowering plants. The building was of ultra-modern design with plate-glass picture windows and exposed woodwork. The roof was split into various levels and planes. The driver parked below the main terrace, and a tall figure came down the steps to welcome Michael as he stepped out of the van. Michael! Rally Tobacco's greeting took him unprepared, as did the friendly smile and hand clasp. It was so different from the spirit of their last meeting in London. Rally wore casual slacks and a white open-necked shirt which emphasised his fine, unblemished skin and his romantic African features. Michael felt a charge of sexual electricity ripple across his fingertips as they shook hands. Rally was still one of the most impressive and attractive men that he had ever met. "'You are welcome,' he said, and Michael looked around him and lifted an eyebrow. "'Not bad, Raleigh. You're still keeping fine style.' "'Oh, this does not belong to me,' Raleigh shook his head. "'I own nothing other than the clothes on my back.' "'Who does this all belong to, then?' "'Oh, questions always questions,' Raleigh chided him with an edge to his voice. "'And I'm a journalist,' Michael pointed out. "'Questions on my meat and drink.' "'Of course.' This house was built by the Trans-Africa Foundation of America for the lady you are about to meet. Trans-Africa? That's, um, that's an American civil rights group, Michael asked. Isn't it run by the colored evangelist preacher from Chicago, Dr. Rondor? Oh, you are well informed, Raleigh took his arm and led him up onto the wide terrace. It must have cost half a million dollars, Michael persisted, and Raleigh shrugged and changed the subject. I promise to show you the children of apartheid, Michael, but first I want you to meet their mother, the mother of the nation. He led Michael across the terrace. There were beach umbrellas spread in the sunshine, like a field of brightly coloured mushrooms. A dozen black children sat at the white plastic tables, drinking Coca-Cola from the cans and listening to one of the ubiquitous portable transistor radios from which blared the driving rhythms of African jazz. There were boys ranging in age from eight or nine years to the late teens. All of them wore canary yellow T-shirts with the legend Gama Athletics Club printed across the chest. None of them stood up as Michael passed, but they watched him with flat, incurious stares. The glass doors of the main building stood open to the terrace, and Raleigh led the way into a split-level living room whose walls were decorated with carved wooden masks and fetish statuettes. The stone floor was covered with animal skin rugs. Something to drink, Michael? Raleigh asked. Coffee or tea? Michael shook his head. Uh, nothing, um, but do you mind if I smoke? <laughs> I remember your habit. Raleigh smiled. Go ahead. I am sorry I can't offer you a match. Michael paused with the lighter in his hand and glanced towards the upper level of the spacious room. A woman came down the steps towards them. Michael took the unlit cigarette from his lips and stared at her. He knew who she was, of course. They called her the Black Evita, the mother of the nation. However, none of the photographs had been able to capture her particular dark beauty and regal presence. Victoria Gama, Raleigh introduced them. This is Michael Courtney, the newspaperman I told you about. Yes, Vicky Gama said. I know who Michael Courtney is. She swept towards him with a stately dignity. She wore a full ankle-length caftan in striking green and yellow and black, the colours of the banned African National Congress, 
Around her head was an emerald green turban. The caftan and the turban were her trademarks. She held out her hand to Michael. It was fine-boned, but the grip of her long, tapered fingers was firm and cool, almost cold. Her skin was velvety smooth and the colour of dark amber. Your mother was my husband's second wife, she told Michael softly. She bore Moses Gama a son, as I did. Your mother is a fine woman, one of us. Michael was always astounded by the total lack of jealousy between the wives of an African man. His wives regarded each other not as rivals, but rather as sisters with family ties and loyalties. How is Tara? Vicky persisted, as she led Michael to one of the sofas and seated him comfortably. I have not seen her for many years. Is she still living in England? And how is Moses' son, Benjamin? Yes, they are living in England, Michael told her. I saw them both in London recently. Benjamin's a big lad now. He's, he's doing very well. He's studying uh, chemical engineering at Leeds University. I wonder if he will ever return to Africa. Vicky sat down beside him. They chatted easily for a while, and Michael found himself coming under the spell of her charming personality. At last she asked, So you want to meet some of my children, the children of Apatheid? It struck Michael that this was the only title for his article, or perhaps series of articles, that he would write. The children of Apartheid, he repeated. Yes, Mrs. Garmer, I would like to meet your children. Please call me Vicky. We are of the same family, Michael. Dare I also hope that our dreams and hopes are the same. Yes, I think that we do have a great deal in common, Vicky. She led him back to the terrace, and she called the children and youths around her and introduced them to Michael. He is our friend, she told them. You may speak freely to him, answer his questions, tell him whatever he wants to know. Michael threw off his jacket and tie and sat under one of the umbrellas. The boys crowded around him. With Vicky Garmer's endorsement and assurance, they seemed to accept him immediately and were delighted that Michael spoke their language. Michael knew how to draw them out. Soon they were competing for his attention. He did not use his notepad to write down what they told him, for he knew that would inhibit them. He valued their spontaneity and frankness, besides which he did not need notes. He would not forget their words and the sound of their young voices. They told him stories that were funny and others that were harrowing. One of the boys had been at Sharpville on that fateful day. As an infant, he had been strapped to his mother's back. The same police bullet that had killed her had shattered one of his legs. The bone had set crookedly, and the other children called him Cripple Pete. Michael wanted to weep as he listened to his story. The afternoon passed too swiftly. Some of the boys left the group to swim in the pool. They stripped naked and plunged into the clear, bright waters. They shrieked with laughter and splashed each other as they played. Rally sat aside with Vicky Garmer and watched the scene. He saw the way that Michael looked at the naked children, and he said to Vicky, I want you to keep him here tonight, she nodded, and he went on. He likes boys. Do you have one of them? She laughed softly. <laughs> he can take his pick. My boys will do whatever I tell them to do. She stood up and walked across to where Michael sat and placed her hand on his shoulder. Why don't you write your articles here? Stay with us tonight. I have a typewriter upstairs that you can use. Spend tomorrow with us also. The boys like you, and there are so many stories to hear. Michael's fingers flew over the typewriter keys in an exuberant allegro and the words appeared on the blank white page in serried ranks like warriors of the mind, ready to charge into the battle. The story wrote itself. It was not the smoke that spiralled up from the cigarette between his lips that made Michael's eyelids prickle as he read what he was writing. Very seldom did he have this conviction of the vital worth and weight of his own composition. He knew, deep in his guts, that this was good, really good. This was the story of the children, as the world should hear it. He finished the article, which he knew now was the only first of a triumphant series, and found that he was trembling with excitement. He glanced at his watch and saw that it was a few minutes before midnight, but he knew he could not sleep. The story still fizzed in his blood and seethed in his brain like some heady champagne. There was a demure tap on the door that startled him. He called softly in Corsa, It is open. Enter. And one of the boys slipped into the bedroom. 
He was dressed only in a pair of blue soccer shorts. I had you typing, he said. I thought that you might like me to bring you some tea. He was the youth whom Michael had most admired in the swimming pool. He had told Michael that he was sixteen years old. His body was sleek and inviting, as a black cat. Thank you, Michael found that his voice was husky. I would like that very much. What are you writing? The youth came to stand behind his chair and leant over him to read the passage. Is this what I told you today? Yes, Michael whispered, and the boy placed his hand on Michael's shoulder and turned his head to smile shyly into Michael's eyes. His breath was warm on Michael's face. I like you, he said. Rally Tobacco read the article as they sat together beside the pool in the early morning sunlight. When he finished, he held the sheaf of papers in both hands and was silent for a long time. Oh, you have a special genius, he said at last. I have never read anything so powerful. But it is too powerful. You dare not publish this. No, not in this country, Michael agreed. The Guardian in London has invited me to submit it to them. It would have the greatest effect there, Raleigh agreed. I congratulate you. Something like this turns the bullets of the oppressor to water. You must finish the series as soon as possible. Stay here another night at least. You seem to work so well when you are close to your subjects. As Michael came awake, he was not certain what had disturbed him. He reached out and touched the warm, smooth body of the boy who lay beside him. The boy muttered and rolled over in his sleep. One of his arms was flung out across Michael's chest. Then the sound that had woken Michael came again. It was faint, from the floor below, in the far reaches of the house. It sounded like a cry of terrible pain. He lifted the arm of the sleeping boy from his chest and slipped out from under it. There was a glimmer of moonlight through the open window, sufficient for him to find his underpants. He moved quietly across the bedroom and let himself out into the passageway. He crept towards the head of the stairs and stood there listening. The sound came up to him again much louder, another wild cry like the voice of a seabird, and it was punctuated by a sharp snapping sound that Michael could not place. He started down the stairs, but had not reached the bottom before a voice arrested him. Michael, what are you doing? Rally Tobacco's voice was sharp and accusing, and Michael started guiltily and looked back up the stairs. Rally stood on the landing in his dressing gown. I, I heard something, Michael said. It sounded like, it is nothing. Go to your room, Michael. But I, I thought that I heard, go to your room. Rally spoke softly, but it was not an order that Michael could disobey. He turned and went back up the stairs. Raleigh reached out to touch his arm as he passed. Sometimes one's hearing plays strange tricks in the night. You heard nothing, Michael. It was a cat, perhaps, or the wind. Go to sleep now. We will talk in the morning. Raleigh waited until Michael had returned to his bedroom and closed the door before he ran down the stairs. He went directly to the kitchen door and threw it open. Victoria Garma, the black Evita, the mother of the nation, stood in the centre of the tiled floor. She was naked to the waist. Her breasts were beautifully shaped, smooth as velvet, black as the fur of sable, large as the ripe tama melons of the Kalahari Desert. In her right hand she held a supple whip made of cured hippo hide, the terrible African shambok. It was slim as one of Vicky's elegant fingers and as long as her arm. In her other hand she held a glass. She was drinking from it as Raleigh burst into the room. The gin bottle stood on the sink behind her, behind her, behind her, behind her. Behind her.